Good evening, everyone. I'd wait. Uh, I'd start off by uh, waiting for a motion to leave the non-public and to seal the minutes. Of so moved. Non-public. So moved. Second. All in favor? All in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any opposed. And now we have to do a um, a roll call to start this meeting, and we will uh, have one counselor joining uh, on Zoom. Sorry, um, Mayor McEachern. Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly. Here. Councilor Tabor. Here. Councilor Denton. Here. Councilor Moreau. Here. Councilor Bagley. Here. Councilor Lombardi. Here. Uh, Councilor Blaylock. Here. And Councilor Cook. Here. Present. Um, and as we uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to call out uh, uh, Portsmouth lost a uh, son, uh, uh, a good friend of, of mine, Councilor Blaylock's, and of many uh, in the room uh, this evening, Brandon Clark, uh, passed away unexpectedly and suddenly uh, just over a week ago uh, today. Um, he leaves behind two beautiful children. Um, Maddie's a senior in high school, and will, and uh, and our hearts mourn for uh, them. Uh, his wife Liz uh, and his parents Kevin and Roseanne. Um, uh, we love you. Uh, you will be missed. Please join me in the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight, we have two proclamations. Uh, the first, I've asked uh, Councilor Moreau uh, to read um, on Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Whereas October was declared National Domestic Violence Awareness Month in 1987 because domestic violence is prevalent in every community and affects all people regardless of age, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, gender, race, religion, or nationality, and whereas we know, sadly, that every minute an average of 20 Americans experience domestic violence, 10 million Americans, including millions of children a year, and that one in every three women and one in every four men are victims of domestic violence in their lifetimes. And whereas all domestic violence incidents affect every person within a home with long lasting negative effects, particularly on children's emotional well being and their social and academic functioning. And whereas here in Portsmouth since 2015, when a safe place and sexual assault support services officially merged into one nonprofit organization, Haven has provided support services and prevention education to those impacted by domestic and sexual violence. And whereas the city of Portsmouth has employed a victim witness advocate since 1999 with funding from the Violence Against Women Act to work with the Portsmouth Police Department to support domestic violence victims under RSA 173B, New Hampshire's Protection of Persons from Domestic Violence Statute. And whereas in 2023, the city moved the victim witness advocate to the city's legal department to support domestic violence victims and to help identify and prosecute domestic violence offenders, together with our police department, schools, and health care providers. And whereas the city of Portsmouth stands with all New Hampshire prosecutors as centuries on the front lines, advocating on behalf of the victims of domestic violence, and whereas the city reminds everyone that confidential local help is available 24 hours a day at Haven Violence Prevention and Support Hotline, 603-994-SAFE. Now, therefore, I, Degla McEachern, Mayor of the City of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the City Council and citizens of Portsmouth, do hereby proclaim October 2023 in Portsmouth as Domestic Violence Awareness Month and call on all citizens to come together to reaffirm our commitment to ending domestic violence and supporting survivors. Given with his hand and the seal of the City of Portsmouth on the 16th day of October 2023, our Mayor. Deglin McKecker. 
I'd just like to personally say that I was actually the president of SAS in uh, 2015 when we merged with the Safe Place. So I have a lot of spent 10 years working with both organizations, Haven, Safe Place, SAS, and have a lot of personal experience dealing with this issue. So I certainly hope that if anyone is ever experiencing anything, that they will reach out because it's a wonderful organization that can help everyone, family members. You don't have to be the victim. You can be family members or just friends who want to know how to support victims. Thank you. Thank you, Council Marone. I believe we have members of, of Paven and the Victim Advocates to yes. receive. Would you come up and we can take a picture up here? Up here, whatever you want. Mr. Mayor, we have Ryan Grogan is our victim witness advocate. Good to see you, Ryan. Legal Department and Police Department, and we have Jean Reed, who's our supervising prosecutor, and I think we have members of Haven. Yes. All right, there's too many people to do it up here. Let's go down there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to use the belt and suspenders approach here, so I'm going to take it with this camera and I'm going to take a couple with my phone too. We have another uh, proclamation for Italian Heritage Month. Whereas, whereas Italian American Heritage Month was created by Congress in 1989 to highlight the contributions Italian immigrants and their descendants have made to the history of our country, and we recognize that Italian Americans have been, contributed greatly to the success of our nation, to the state of New Hampshire and to Portsmouth Society, business, government, music, the arts, and the sciences. And whereas the stories of the Italian families who migrated to Portsmouth in the late 1800s and early 1900s, along with millions of their fellow citizens sailing past Lady Liberty, lifting her lamp beside the open door, are stories of how their family members built Portsmouth and nourished their families and this city. And whereas so many of the families remain in Portsmouth, so many from our friendship city of Santa Carla, Santa Tar Cagello and from San Giovanni and Carcio, that reading phone books there is to read names that are familiar here, such as Pesarisi, Farini, Semprini, De Stefano, Risiputi, who have contributed so much to the rich Italian heritage of our city and the United States. That, whereas this proclamation of the Friendship City Agreement in 2019 said the cities of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, USA, and Santa Cagello de Romana, Italy share similar goals of international cooperation, mutual prosperity, and world peace, and believe it is to be their collective interest to broaden and strengthen ties between the two cities. And whereas we welcome a delegation of students and teachers from Santa Cagello next week to reinforce our friendship bonds and to launch an exchange in Italian language program at Portsmouth High School. And whereas earlier this summer we celebrated the Little Italy Carnival as a signature event of Portsmouth, New Hampshire 400 to recognize the resilience an indomitable spirit of Italians who have settled, married, and raised their families in Portsmouth North End and who were uprooted and displaced between 1969 and 1971 by the misguided practices of urban renewal. And whereas there is a small granite bench on Deer Street with the names of those displaced families whose homes one former resident described when the bench was placed in 1998, the door was always open to neighbors and the table was always welcoming with a glass of homemade wine and Italian breads or cookies. And whereas 
Nearly 11 percent of the population of New Hampshire claims Italian heritage, making the Granite State the seventh most Italian-American state in the nation. And during October, we take pause to reflect on the contributions as well as the struggles hard fought and overcome by Italian-Americans here in Portsmouth and throughout our nation's history. Now, therefore, I, Dago McCachran, Mayor of the City of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the City Council and citizens of Portsmouth, do hereby proclaim October 2023 in Portsmouth as Italian-American Heritage Month and call upon the residents of Portsmouth to celebrate the Italian heritage our sister citizens have come to share with us and to embrace our friendship city of Santa Cargello with Portsmouth's welcoming, always open door given with my hand and the seal of the city of Portsmouth on this sixth day of October 2023. Thank you. And if I could ask uh, Mike Daigle of the Friends of Italian Americans to come up and receive this. Oh, and Elise Gallo, too. Sorry. Oh, come down. Or you guys want to come down again? Okay. with this and we're going to take a couple with my phone. One, two, three. <laughs> new, new camera, new camera. No, it's belt, belt and suspenders approach. Belt and suspenders. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All set. Thank you. There are no minutes uh, to accept this evening, um, so we will move on to public comment. Uh, first up uh, is Roy Helsel on city development. Good evening, Roy Helsel, 777 Middle Road, Unit 22. Portsmouth, New Hampshire. But after they built a high rise over next to the parking garage and started to build another one, I happened to be in western Mexico. And there were people from California and Texas, and we were talking to ask where we were from. And I told him, from New Hampshire, he said, where? Portsmouth. He said, what are they doing to that town? that ugly building they built. He says, we want to go to New England, nice village, town. We don't want to go to Boston. If we want to go to Boston, we go to Boston. He said, what are they doing? I said, they're going to build more. He said, well, we won't go there. And that's a couple from California and Texas. And now they're calling this little Boston. And there are many people that come to a unique New England town, and they don't want to come to Portsmouth anymore. They want to go to a unique little New England town, and we're being overbuilt, and that's a shame because it's ruining the city. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Um, next, we have uh, uh, Carino Construction. Is this, um, is this a representative, Carino Construction? For the, oh, okay, so you don't need to, you're here to answer questions. Okay, got it. All right, first time. All right, then, then um, Mike Daigle, come on up. Uh, Friends of Italian Americans. Excuse me, I can't see. Uh, hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Mike Daigle. I live on State Street. I'm here tonight as a resident of Portsmouth and as a president of a newly formed nonprofit called Friends of Italian Americans. Um, before I start, I just want to thank each of you for your service and time commitment to the city of Portsmouth. 
essentially you are volunteers uh, trying your best and I just think your service to Portsmouth needs to be recognized so thank you over the past few years I've tried to support uh, some community efforts as some of you know most recently I was on the Portsmouth Little Italy Carnival Committee to support the August 6 carnival I helped raise some funds tried to assist with the logistics of the carnival and I think we can all say the carnival was a success with and Massimo, Robin Aldo, Dawn P, numerous other um, committee members and volunteers did an excellent job um, honoring the resiliency of our lost immigrant, <clears throat> excuse me, in Italian community. The council should be proud of the activities these folks accomplished. At the carnival, as a member of the Friends of Italian Americans, I helped out at their booth. The Friends um, is a newly formed nonprofit, as I stated, whose mission is to become the local voice of Italian and immigrant families. Over 600 people visited our booth, including the Italian Consul General from Boston. The Friends were a proud luminary sponsor of the Little Inuit Carnival, and we think the overall the whole carnival was a massive success. At the booth, there were some historical pictures of the lost neighborhood on the Friends table. The pictures generated quite a few stories, most of them heartbreaking, about the Italians and immigrants who were displaced by a prior city council's effort at urban renewal. More than one individual came over and commented that their relative was in one of the pictures. One other individual mentioned that his grandfather sold sausage to Mario's store, and if you went in the back, you could get a plate of pasta and meatballs for a dollar. Another said his former home is now the lobby of the Sheridan Hotel. All of them were visibly distressed by what happened to their families under the guise of urban renewal. The Friends and I are proud to have helped honor the resiliency of Portsmouth's lost community and work with various uh, committee members to make the carnival happen. Portsmouth is the city of the open door, and I hope the, uh, the carnival honored the lost neighborhood adequately. I also hope honoring the lost community becomes an annual event. In addition to sponsoring the Little Italy Carnival, the Friends have been quite active. On Columbus Day, we hosted a breakfast at the Sheridan, and Senator Lou D'Alessandro read the New Hampshire Senate's resolution, can I keep going? New, the New Hampshire Senate's resolution making October Italian American Heritage Month. We also reviewed Governor Sununu's Sununu, proclamation making October Italian Heritage Month, and I'm proud to have accepted the City of Portsmouth resolution <clears throat> making October Italian Heritage Month as we just witnessed. The Friends have also donate, facilitated a donation to the Portsmouth School System to purchase $1,700 worth of books for the fifth grade language, Italian language classes in the Portsmouth Elementary Schools. The acceptance of this donation was approved at last week's Portsmouth School Board, and the mayor just announced, uh, just announced that activity. Lastly, I'm very pleased to announce that Bayberry Vintage Autos, an original founder of the Friends of Italian Americans, has agreed to donate an antique 1920 American La France pump and ladder fire truck to Portsmouth to the Portsmouth Fire Department. This donation is up for City Council review and I believe approval at tonight's meeting. And the Friends of Italian Americans and our growing membership hope the City Council will approve this significant donation. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> Next up, uh, also on Italian, uh, American uh, Italians, Elise Gallo. I'm so glad he went first so I don't have to repeat all of that. Thank you so much for that proclamation um, today. That, that's exactly what I had hoped for. I wrote all of you and, um, and Deglin as well, um, and this is the essence of my letter. Um, I'm a grateful American of 100% Italian heritage and feel like I've lost the one nationally recognized day to openly celebrate my cultural roots because of the erasure of that in this fair city. But I learned a great deal this summer at the 400 celebrations about how that group suffered here in Portsmouth as a result of urban renewal and displacement. But not having our day recognized here feels like another slap. 
especially to those of us who understand Columbus Day was established as a holiday in 1892. It was an effort to heal the country after 11 Italian Americans were murdered in one of the largest mass lynchings in American history. It's just unlucky for us. They didn't call it Amerigo Vespucci Day, otherwise we would not have these issues today. Um, and then I asked for that proclamation, but you went so far over and above. I'm so excited about that. Um, at the Italian American, uh, the Friends of Italian American Breakfast, Columbus Day, I had a nice chat with um, Katie Cook and, and, and appreciated our, um, our discussion about um, kind of the, um, almost like the conflict between Indigenous Day and Columbus Day that happened last year and kind of in a resulting vote. And, and I'm discouraged about that because I never want to feel like we're in competition, <laughs> that one indigenous group is, is in competition with an immigrant group that has kind of similar issues, similar um, discrimination issues. And so I wanted to just talk a little bit about my firsthand knowledge um, about Columbus Day. Um, unfortunately, again, it was named Columbus Day because it was a 400th anniversary of the discovery um, by Columbus. But essentially, in 1891, there was a, just a heinous hate crime in New Orleans, and that was about the time when uh, my great-grandfather, who was 27 years old, uh, was married to his 17-year-old wife in Coronata um, in East Harlem in New York. Um, and like many other Southern Italians arriving from about 1878, they were steered towards housing in a mixed community, including Irish, German, um, Jewish immigrants. But by 1900, the area was dominated by Southern Italians, very similar to the community here, uh, eventually becoming what they was known as Little Italy. Mostly it was Sicilians or Southern, um, Southern Italians, and my family was from Calabria. Um, about 100,000 of them crammed into tenement buildings in East Harlem, mostly hoping to escape the poverty of Southern Italy. They just came for economic opportunities. And like here in Portsmouth, they attempted to sustain many of the traditions they left behind. Am I done? Just, uh, no, you can I'll, I'll be quick. Um, a couple of years after those 11 Italians were lynched in New Orleans, they had the first of their four children. And he was born and christened Gaetano. This was my grandfather. But you see, he had one of those names ending in vowels and that dark southern Italian skin. And those brought down hatred and violence and trouble that no one wanted, and lynchings in some part of the country. So they, they called him Thomas. And I never understood this. But my father, who died when he was 98 a couple years ago, was adamant that every child, every grandchild, was named Thomas. And he was just crazy about this. I mean, even the girls, you have to name her Thomasina. And we never really understood this. But the fact that they had to change Gaetano to Thomas to kind of escape discrimination was really behind that there was a real passion about this and kind of irrational passion about it. Um, and it made a lot more sense as I kind of delved into the, that name change. But my grandfather grew up in a ghetto, a slum, a tenement. It housed all his cousins, uncles and aunts, six to seven families in a walk up, one shared toilet. Um, they weren't saints by any means. They were laborers by day and had vices at night. My grandfather was apparently quite a pool shark and a gambler. Um, and when he got home, his, my grandmother took his winnings and saved it for a, a new shirt or a, a special cut of meat. But it was squalor and they were determined to keep it clean and keep their children clean and fed and get them educated off the streets and keep them alive and out of reach uh, of a lot of ne'er-do-wells on every corner, including the mafia that tempted their sons with candy and coins. Um, so there's discrimination in just about every, <laughs> um, every group that made this country. And I, I'm hoping that um, this board or whatever board is voted in come November, will consider restoring our day, whether you call it Columbus or not, I don't care. But I really need to kind of raise my green, white, and red flag on, on that day and be, proud of, um, and be proud of our Italian heritage. So uh, you can call it Italian American Day. But please restore um, what a lot of us took as really a slap to kind of get rid of our one day where we, we celebrate. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Uh, next up is uh, Lonnie Sherry. Cherry, um, on Kino, anybody that wants to talk about Kino, you can do it for three minutes now or you can do it in an unlimited fashion uh, at the um, 
Then we have we have a public hearing on that. Yeah, but you can do it. You can do it at both if you want. But first up is is Lonnie. Do you want to speak now or later? We'll wait. We'll wait. Okay. And then uh, Tom and Eli, you're going to wait as well. Okay. All right. Rick, um, former Mayor Beckstead, uh, follow up question. Good evening, Rick Beckstead, 1395 Lisbon Street. I can't stay for that, but I will say I'm hoping third time is the charm for Tino, and I'm hoping that it'll go through. Uh, just a couple little follow-up questions. I thought it was interesting to see the collective bargaining agreement that you just had with another non-public meeting. I'm just kind of curious, seems that wasn't that long ago, with the contracts that you did for our police and our fire that we basically emptied the well of what little we had gone and actually put aside for collective bargaining. So anything moving forward, it'll be interesting to see where that money comes from, seeing that the account is now empty. Um, the other thing is, is just I, I wanted to go and ask. The previous council, December 20th, 2021, had allocated $2.2 million for a skateboard park. It was unanimous. It was approved by the finance department. It was taken out of unassigned fund balance. We voted on it 9 to 0. This council, over the last two years, actually went and bonded $2.8 million for that same skateboard park. Myself and the public would really like to know what happened to the $2.2 million, because this council, I went back and reviewed again, never reallocated the $2.2 million that was taken out of that budget. We're not really sure what happened to it. Now, as a counselor, you don't know everything, but you need to know a little about everything, just a little bit. And uh, I think this is a worthy cause. I think the residents and the taxpayers deserve to know what happened to that $2.2 million. Whether it be now, whether it be later, uh, I think myself and the taxpayers of Portsmouth would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next up, Peter Huda on Mr. Tabor request. Good evening. I'll help you out there. Mr. Tabor's request for uh, year end financials. Okay, Mr. Tabor made a request at the last meeting, uh, which I was glad he did. Um, I looked for the update in the packet. I was disappointed that it wasn't in the packet, but it was included tonight. Um, I have some questions since I just saw the information. Uh, the first question uh, that I do have is, are these audited financial numbers or is this just an estimate? The reason I'm asking about this is um, per our audit contract, um, according to the audit contract, CLA um, has five months to complete our audit. That would be November, Mr. Tabor. So um, my question is, what, what comprises the numbers that we are seeing? The next thing I'd like to say is when I saw the number of the surplus, I was totally blown away. I have done analysis of the last 10 years of surpluses. This is the largest surplus we have ever had. And what that really means is that you have overcharged the taxpayers by $7.2 million for services that they didn't get, for people that weren't hired. This should go back to the taxpayers, not in dribs and drabs in the, in the general fund, like is shown in here, the full amount. This is an overcharge. The next thing I'd like to address is, um, on, Councilor, on Councilor Tabor's uh, behalf, um, as the audit chair, who has not held a meeting since the selection of the auditor, um, I'd like to put to rest something that has been said on a number of your sites. And it's, I, for me, it's, it's a very frustrating mistake that you're making. Uh, the, the statement is basically you're taking credit for, as chair of the audit committee, hired the city's first new independent audit in tw auditor in 21 years. Mr. Tabor, it's 28 years. And the reason this is auditor was hired is because the other one was bought out and, and you couldn't hire them back again. And a lot of us are aware of that. So please, how about some truth here? Thank you. 
Thank you, Pichu. Uh, next up, Paige Trace on housekeeping. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Paige Trace, 27 Hancock Street. I had to change it up. I know. It was always Portsmouth. <laughs> it's always Portsmouth. Well, this is Portsmouth housekeeping. Um, I will be quick and short and to the point. You had a non-public meeting, yet another one, on collective bargaining, and yet you used RSA 91A 3A2, which is actually the RSA that pertains to you requesting legal, legal advice about a legal matter. So I can only assume that it was collective bargaining and a legal matter. Yet early on in June, you had, um, there was a decision by the Supreme Court about the great case that never ends, the Weber Goodwin case. And it actually the Supreme Court decided in your favor with a potential for it to be appealed and we've never heard anything about it. Very interesting that the city doesn't know that you actually won on appeal the fact that the arbiter misquoted, miscalculated um, whether or not Mr. Goodwin should be receiving his back pay. And it's still on appeal, but we don't know anything about it, hush, hush. I can only assume that it probably wasn't that in non-public, but it sure would be nice to hear about it. My second part of housekeeping is in trying to look up, as a candidate running for city council, I'm looking for minutes of the fire commission, and there are no minutes. As a matter of fact, in October, they approved the September 12th meeting minutes but they aren't there. They don't exist. So maybe we could have some minutes from the fire commission. Finally, I do realize that they voted evidently not to have to take minutes, but they obviously voted to approve them. So maybe it would be nice if as a public commission, the public could see the meeting minutes. Um, my other question is for Council Tabor on the audit commission. When are you having a meeting? Please, sir. It's a public commission. People would like to know. And the rest I will save for later. But thank you very much. Thank you, Paige. Uh, finally in the room, uh, Esther Kennedy on the topic of water. If you'd like to speak during public comment, please raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. And recently um, I discovered that an RFP was brought in for the pipeline going across Great Bay. And it seems substantially more than what was originally put in to the budget and the finances. It was from 8 million to 28 million. And I guess my concern is where is that fitting in the process of things? Um, I believe the council should do a public informative session on the drinking water, um, in particular include the potential migration um, of chemicals from the Tolan site into Madbury, and then also the pipeline that goes along the river or through the river and the cost of that increase. I believe, as we all do, water is very important and just recently it, I've come to the conclusion that we need to have um, some information. We need to be told what's going on as citizens and we really need to get an update and maybe we include all water, all drinking water, not all water, but all drinking water and look at what we're going forward with given what we're seeing in some of our, um, in other places in the state and their wells. So I would encourage us to have a uh, drinking water 101 and maybe give some updates on the pipe that goes under the river and the cost and what we're doing. I have said for numerous years, there is two pipes there currently and there's only on the books to replace one. 
and I really worry not having a backup. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, we have Zalita Morgan on Zoom. Hello, counselors. Zalita Morgan, Richard Zavenue. Um, I want to thank you for your service. And um, after watching a little bit um, the the most recent um, uh, candidates' night, um, not a karaoke though, the one from the uh, city voters. Um, I just want to point out a couple things. Um, I heard somewhere that ADU being brought up as like initiative towards affordability or affordable housing or ADUs are not affordable. Or maybe they are for you. I don't know. Because if they these are going for $3,000 a year, $4,000, so I don't know what measure of affordability, uh, how anybody could make a statement that ADUs have made any improvement to affordable housing. We're creating probably housing that are affordable to few, but not to the working um, people in our community. Um, I also want to, um, to express how uh, my disappointment um, not with the work done by necessarily by the governance committee, but the process itself. I think as leaders, you absolutely have um, the, 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 the opportunity to present thoughts and proposals. And, but when it comes to the governance, since it's beyond just policy, you are creating, making some decisions in a very short period of time, impacting how you govern, and again, in a very insulated matter. Because if 15 people at a 10 o'clock in the morning, the most, and like a first, second reading, you think that that is participation, that's what governance should be, engagement, you are trying to engage people. I mean, this is serious matter. And you are about to have a vote on ethics and you never, never, ever touched on training on how you're going to qualify people to ever make a judgment on ethics. And that, to me, this is absolutely absurd. In a climate action plan, um, I just want to make a point, because that comes about how you manage or not uh, your actions to the city manager or city management. I mean, for two councils, there have been a total of three unanimously approved actions to go to the city staff and come back to the city city council. The latest one brought by, I think, Councilor Denton. I mean, where is the stuff? So it is for, for, for almost four years, three initiatives, and nothing has come back. So it raises a question, and absolutely, that it's much ado about nothing from you because if you have initiatives the counselors have initiatives you approve you send to the city manager you're not following up on that and you don't have a feedback and you don't ask for it then you owe us so you don't follow up on the actions that you think on the things you think they're a priority you exclude yourself from discussions that have impact on affordability like discussions on, on, on a, uh, union contracts, discussions on um, public-private par partnerships like the McIntyre's and others, you have not implemented a governance for these public-private partnerships. So in other words, you have divested yourself from our government, from really representing us. Because by the way, we don't need just faces there. We need people who really spell out what your your uh, values, you know, and principles are, and how your actions match. Because right now what you say and what you have done in two years are extremely disappointing. Very, very disappointing. Thank you, you have done nothing. Zoeta, well. I don't, uh, we've gone over time, okay. but, but thank you very much for your okay. comments. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. One more person. Okay. Yeah. Jackie, yeah, come on up, Jackie. Oh, 
<laughs> well, we, we do the sign up, but we have be, plenty of time. I know, but we're gonna I know. Get to Kino and, next. But something moved me very much, and I promised somebody that I would say something. Um, first, I want to say that I'm proud of my Italian American heritage. And I worked at the carnival and I had a ball. And I was sorry that we didn't get to taste the food that you cooked, Maya. I didn't cook anything. They well, they, you, me, you I tasted. tasted. Yeah, they won't, yeah. They don't and want me we to smelled, cook. those of yeah. us who volunteered. Let me just say this. I had a very interesting conversation with a gentleman this week that really touched me. Um, the gentleman was obviously homeless. And there are a couple of questions that came to my mind. One is, do we know the census of homeless people in the city? Two where I used to live, there was a homeless encampment, and I know that is scheduled to be developed. His, his question to me, I, I asked him, I tried to tell him where we could get food and whatever. He said, no, he said, anybody who doesn't, who goes hungry in Portsmouth is stupid because this community is very generous with giving food to the poor, and we are. But he looked at me, and I, I couldn't answer his question. He said, but where do I go when it gets cold? And where do I put the woman that I'm living with? He was worried about the cold coming. So I'm just gonna ask you, do we have plans for emergency warming shelters? And if we do, maybe we need to make them known. I'm asking you to do that, ma'am. So um, the Operation Blessing has increased uh, through they help. Did. The city is now at a permanent, um, uh, a permanent uh, warming shelter for 12 beds uh, that also includes a shower, uh, and that opens when temperatures drop below 32 degrees. And they also have a facility in there, but it's not enough. It's not going to accommodate. And the problem that some of the shelters have, and I'm not going to name any, but I'm, I'm familiar with Operation Blessing. I was here when it started. Uh, however, staffing is a problem there. So people don't want to stay overnight at the facility. So staffing is the problem, even volunteer staffing. So I, I would just ask you to look a little bit harder at that as the cold winter moves in on us. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Okay. Sure. Uh, what's your name and address? Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Gary Epler, 2 Sylvester Street, Portsmouth. Uh, thank you. If, if, if you recall, um, I appeared before you um, several months ago, I think in your, one of your July or August um, council meetings, uh, to talk about um, a change uh, regarding uh, EV charging stations. And um, I, I still, I've tried to follow up on that just to see what was, what's happened with that. And my understanding, there was a unanimous vote. It was supposed to go to the planning um, board for, for comment and report back. It still hasn't gone there as far as I'm aware. Um, for some reason, I believe it was sent possibly to the land use committee, but that's not what the council di directed. Uh, in its unanimous vote. So I ask you to please follow up on that. It's critical that the ordinance change regarding EV um, charging to allow that uh, to occur in the city. What, again, I, I, I've heard this second and third hand, so I don't know if it's accurate, um, but there's a, I'm concerned that it's not seen as a priority because there's a sense that it, on a practical level, the city does allow um, other locations other than what's provided in the ordinance. If that's the case, then this should be a no-brainer, and the ordinance change should get before you and should, and should vote on it straight up. Um, the second issue uh, it is similar in that um, in the October 19th, 2020 uh, meeting of the mayor and city council, there was a 9-0 to zero unanimous roll call vote to send a letter to the planning board for report back. Um, with uh, suggestions on where a five-acre solar installations should be in the city and how many homes can be affected with that type of zoning amendment. Um, my understanding is that nothing has been done on this. The planning, planning board has not gotten the letter. Uh, there's been no action on this. 
Um, again, this is, um, this is a critical matter. The, the climate crisis really is a crisis. If anyone doesn't believe that, I'd be happy to have that discussion offline uh, with anybody. Um, but we need to, we, meaning the city um, and all of us here, really need to make these kinds of changes to in, encourage this kind of development, um, both in terms of uh, solar generation and in terms of allowing the EV infrastructure to build out to get fast chargers. It's really a shame that given what this city is, what it represents to outsiders and also insiders here, people who live here in the city, that we don't have any fast chargers within the, the city limits. That really needs to change. The ordinance needs to be changed. The council has voted to, to take that action, both on the EV charging and on trying to see if there can be some solar development. So I'd ask you to please push that up to your priority and, and, and see that that's followed through. Thank you very much. Again, I appreciate your hard work and your efforts on behalf of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Seeing no other hands raised or individuals here. Um, Your Honor, if you're closing. Yeah, I would like to, can we pull up Kino first and then maybe your presentation, your requested exactly presentation? Exactly what I would have motioned. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Is there a second? Second. Uh, wait, we need to suspend. We need to suspend, suspend the, rules the rules to do those two things. Yeah, I'd make a motion to suspend the rules to bring Kino forward, followed by the uh, year-end fiscal presentation. Second. Uh, and we need a roll call vote. I guess. <laughs> so, in, when there's a Zoom participant, we gotta we have to have a roll call vote. Okay, Sister Mia Kelly. Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. So we will first have the public hearing regarding Kino within the city of Portsmouth. There's no vote for us. This is ahead of the ballot um, question um, on November 7th. And we're going to start with a presentation. Mr. McIntyre is no relation to the building. Uh, <laughs> it is not. Don't hold there. it against him. Just <laughs> listen to this. Uh, I would like to note to the one who spoke earlier, I have no problem with gambling. I'd like you to know that. <laughs> Sorry. I'll run through this quickly. Obviously, you have a busy agenda, lots of folks here. Uh, this is obviously just an informational session for the citizens of Portsmouth who We'll have an opportunity to vote on whether Kino is approved for Portsmouth in the next municipal election. It's a game, essentially bingo, just done a little bit faster, where 20 winning numbers are drawn every five minutes. Sales occur throughout the day. This is only done in New Hampshire. So if somebody's running this? Yep, that's me. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Can you go to the next screen, please? How to play is essentially you, bet, you can bet a dollar or more. You can pick up to 12 numbers and out of a field of 80. And if your numbers win, you win. Um, you can use a bet slip, which is what that piece of paper is in the second box from the left. You can do it from uh, one of our terminals, which are self-service. And there are screen monitors in bars and taverns. That's what that screen is to the right. Um, there are currently 250 locations across the state where you can play Kino. Um, some local here, uh, Rawlingsford, Rochester, Seabrook, Hampton, a few others local. Um, there are that number of cities and towns across the state. That seems low, but you have to realize up north there are lots of cities and towns that don't have any businesses in them. So there are a lot of unincorporated townships, small towns that just don't have them. So they're not approved there yet. Um, as of 2022, uh, the legislature approved the sale of Kino tickets in stores that don't serve alcohol um, across the state in towns and cities that already approved it. Um, about 206 community stores now sell it. Um, and it's, we do about um, 50 some odd million dollars a year in sales. You go to the next slide, please. Those are the commissions that retailers actually enjoy from the sale of Kino. So in FY 23, it was $4.4 .4 million across the 400 stores. So that averages about to $10,000 a store. 
What is more important uh, is to the local business is that particularly in locations that are social, meaning bars and taverns, the patrons tend to stay longer because they're playing. The people who work there, servers, waiters, waitresses, tend to get tipped far more because if you win $100 and you don't tip your waiter or waitress $10, you're considered a monster. Um, and so frequently they will get tipped heavily. Moreover, all those winnings are actually circulated in the tavern environment, meaning if you won, say, $450 and you don't buy a round, similarly you are considered a monster. And so uh, that increases business uh, sales in the, in the location. If you would, next slide, please. And obviously, these are the benefits to the retail stores. Uh, it's an increased commission rate, 8% versus 5% of other lottery games. When we did a poll after we launched this through UNH, um, we found that 75% of our retail network that did sell Kino saw a lift in other stuff, in some cases significantly. Um, it, it, like I said, it, it uh, increases revenue for other things. Um, it also allows, once again, that revenue to stay in the location and be generated into other purchases. And if you the last slide, um, the, it allows for foot traffic in businesses. And if you have a store, you know how important foot traffic is. And so, for example, like that Powerball jackpot, uh, that drives a ton of foot traffic and that increases the sale. A study done by the Community Store Association of America um, found that every dollar of lottery is accompanied by three dollars of something else, soda, chips, et cetera. And so that helps small businesses. Um, one of the things New Hampshire has learned early through our brothers at liquor is that retail behavior doesn't care about geography. And so if a town across the way is selling it and folks want to go play Kino, they'll drive across town to go to another location. And so we have found that to be the case in many cities and towns around the state where folks will drive to where they can play Kino because they actually like doing it. So, um, and that is Kino in five minutes or less. I did not hear a buzzer, Mr. Mayor, so I assume I'm no, on the, the, I'm on the limit. The you didn't have and to certainly go. more important than any presentation I give is to answer any questions you folks may have or any citizen of Portsmouth. Uh, happy to answer anything. Any council questions, Mr. McIntyre? Councilor Tabor. I have a question. Uh, what's the average patron spend on Kino? Do you have any? I haven't. It's a good question. I haven't asked. Uh, one of the difficulties is tracking retail behavior that's in person, as you can imagine. Like how many how many sodas do you drink? I, I don't know. It tends to be low dollars. Actually, it's more sort of the the nature of it with people playing against each other and picking numbers. So I would guess no more than fifteen dollars a, a nighter, the equivalent. And the payout is around 70%. So you're as likely, if you paid $10 worth, you'd get $7 back in prizes ultimately. Thanks. So it's not as simple as just retail behavior in terms of buying a product, like a commodity. Oh, this is easy. And, uh, Mr. <clears throat> any other questions? Are there any, I guess one, is there any difference in terms of the money uh, the Education Trust Fund receives, uh, whether or not a town uh, participates or not? It does not. One of the best parts about my job is I have zero say on how education money gets spent. We just make a bunch of it and drop it off at the State House. Great. Yeah. And uh, before I forget, please, my sincere thanks for taking me out of line early. I really, truly appreciate it. Well, there's a lot of people in the room that also <laughs> will appreciate it, too. So they're going to uh, they're going to come up and speak next. OK. Um, if there's no other uh, questions, uh, we'll have a chance for any other deliberations. But let's open up the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Really Thanks, appreciate, it. appreciate it. Now, you have no time limit here. I would <clears throat> ask you still honor three minutes in your heart. Um, but, uh, Mr. Remick. Yeah, one minute. And George Remick, I choose 1247 South Street. I want to thank all of you for putting it on the ballot already and to other people that are here come vote please it's on the bottom of the ballot not the back so <laughs> maybe this year we can pull something i hope and we did we used to have bingo here as he said this is no more than glorified bingo and we used to have a hall on lad street in portsmouth for many years 1981 we ran finished up but that was Good times. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. 
In, in any order, you guys can. You don't have to sign up for, for this one. Good evening. Eli Sarkarals, 15, Larry Lane, Portsmouth. Um, I presently have Keno in my uh, establishment in Seabrook, which is 12 Ocean Grill. And I've had it for since it started. And to answer the question, most uh, couples come in at dinner or lunchtime, and they'll play $10 because uh, every five minutes is a game. It takes them about an hour to get through those games. They've had their dinner or their lunch, and they've gone. That's kind of how it works. Uh, I know the council knows that um, none of this is taxpayer money. It is all generated from the sales of Kino, and uh, I just uh, like to say I'd like to see the city of Portsmouth be a contributor into the kindergarten program, which is uh, very important to the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eli. Any questions? Oh, we can't take questions uh, on <laughs> okay. this. That's, that's, Thank you. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Good evening again, Your Honor. Frank Desper, Portsmouth American Legion. Again, I just want to reiterate all the funds that would be coming into the post. Support the Portsmouth Little League team, uh, Portsmouth Middle School basketball team, Portsmouth uh, uh, Legion prep team, junior team, senior team. Scholarships that we give away, I don't want to see any of these programs go away. Please vote yes for Kino. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Your Honor, Councilors, I'm Lonnie Cherry, uh, one spinnaker way, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, I'm a member of the Portsmouth Elks, an officer there. Um, we're not a retail store, but we support Kino. Um, it's a big part of what we do as Elks, it's charitable giving. And as, um, as a charitable organization, that revenue that most of the retail businesses would see, we turn back into the city in a way of uh, charitable givings. Um, like the Legion and uh, many other programs, we support um, the rec department, um, a lot of shelters and stuff like that. Um, we also do... Um, What's it called? I'm on a blank right now. Um, scholarships and stuff like that for the city of Portsmouth, for our, our youth. And we would um, love to see the city of Portsmouth voters vote this in so that we could continue that charitable giving and all the good work that we do at the Portsmouth Elks. Um, so I hopefully that, uh, and I thank you for putting it on the ballot this year and hope to see that this passes this time around. Thank you. Thank you, Lonnie. I said, just said thank you, Lonnie. Thank you. <laughs> Evening, Tom. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you for your time. My name is Tom Bowden. I live at 892 Owen Road in Portsmouth. Lifelong member of this town. I'm proud to live here. And uh, as wonderful as this town is, you heard about some people tonight that might need a little pick-me-up from time to time. As a member of the Elks, I speak for myself and almost 2,000 members of the Portsmouth Lodge 97. I'm just going to give you some quick bullet points as far as where the money we raise goes. Having Keno would drastically increase the amount of funding that we can give back. Last year, we provided 47 full Christmas Day food baskets to local families in need. That's everything they need from breakfast, Christmas dinner, dessert. We also delivered 305 $25 gift cards to people in elderly housing in Portsmouth. I dressed up as Santa Claus and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> the balance of the funding from that went to a gift of warmth. We also host a disabled veterans kayak event. We're an active partner in End 68 Hours of Hunger. We work with the Brownies and Girl Scouts every year to provide uh, handmade Christmas cards 
to people in Portsmouth Housing. Last year, well, I don't have this year's number, but last year we provided 304 welcome home kits to veterans that were finally granted housing. These welcome home kits include everything from they need a toaster, socks, deodorant, whatever these people need, we make sure that they have so they can get off on the right foot. We help out with Portsmouth Recreation. We also have, uh, I believe you guys saw our presentation last week on Project Link, which is a massive program that Elise spearheaded and I'm very proud to be a part of that. Um, that provides concert tickets, barbecues, shows, sporting events in order to help reduce the suicide rate of the sailors that are brave enough to serve our Navy, 18 to 21 years old. Annually, our lodge in Portsmouth contributes approximately, give or take year to year, $100,000 back to the community from funds raised at our lodge. Having Keno granted in our town would drastically increase the amount of people that we can help on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week -week basis, month-to-month, -month, and a year-to-year. -year. So I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for putting it on the ballot. I graciously hope the people watching this, the people that can hear me, are willing to put this forward to try to make somebody's day brighter that actually needs it. So thank you very much for your time. God bless. Thank you, Tom. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Paige Trace, 27 Hancock Street. In full disclosure, as a candidate for city council this year, I feel compelled to speak about Kino. It's probably not to everyone at home. It's gone around twice already. And this is number three. So we realize that it's not in everyone's interest to have Kino. But I feel compelled tonight to say that I, for one, believe that it's time for Keno. Its time has come. It does too much good and could do too much good not to vote for it, not to put it on the ballot. It, it should be there. You know, when you hear one elk after another speak about all the good that it could potentially do for people in this city, it's a ripple effect. Maybe you don't like the idea of gambling. Maybe it concerns you that there are people that have needs that they shouldn't be gambling. But the fact of the matter is that the majority of people playing Keno are simply doing it, as Mr. Remick said, for you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour during dinner. And what it's going to do for the Elks and other places like the Elks, what it's going to do for the kindergarten fund at the state level, far outweighs, in my mind, the problems that might occur. And so I ask in the interests of being fair to all that we finally look at the third time around for Keno and say yes. Please, Portsmouth. It has the ability to do too much good for this city to say no. And I thank you tonight for your time. Thank you, Paige. Any other speakers to, for, or against from the audience? Seeing none rise, do not see any on Zoom. Uh, I will close the public hearing. Are there any additional council questions or deliberations? I will, uh, I will offer uh, this that I do think that the, the third time uh, will be the charm uh, on this. Uh, there's a lot um, of discussion that's, that's gone into this, and the folks that have been continually talking about this uh, have been some of our uh, hardest working business people um, in Portsmouth, um, but also some organizations that do a lot of good, um, the American Legion, uh, being one of them, uh, the Elks uh, being another. Um, and given the day and age when 
anybody can gamble um, on a phone. Um, it seems that we give the opportunity to decide whether or not Kino resides in a business uh, to those businesses in Portsmouth. So, um, again, not a uh, not a um, no vote uh, on the city council, but there will be one on November seventh. So, back to the regularly scheduled public hearings. Oh no, never mind. What we already did decided uh, for uh, Councilor Tabor's uh, request back on the report. Um, let's see, where 13. is 13. that? It's under presentations. It's under presentations. Got it. Yeah. It's like when we start moving things, then just the, 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 the curtain is revealed that I just keep going down a list here. Um, all right, so uh, financial update as requested by Councilor Tabor uh, as under presentation. City Manager, I believe uh, that is yours. All right, thank you. Bringing it up on uh, on the screen and asking my colleagues, the Finance Director Judy Belanger and Parking Director Ben Fletcher to join me. Before we get started, I just want to clear up two quick things. Uh, Fire Chief McQuillan reminds uh, all of us that the meeting minutes are in fact at the bottom of the page on the Fire, on the fire Department and Fire Commission's um, page of the website. And um, if I may, because it relates to, to money and water and, and everyone is, uh, is uh, critically concerned with water. Um, I'm speaking about the Little Bay water line. The bid was for almost 26 million, which we rejected. And our recent water supply update covers much of the information um, that Ms. Kennedy was looking for. And that is on our website as of last week. And at the end of the project, when completed, we will end up with three pipes instead of uh, the one. And uh, we are looking into multiple options besides simply rebidding. So with that, uh, I will speak to, um, just to kick things off, and I appreciate everyone's uh, thoughts for a moment. Um, the question was, are these audited? These are not audited. These are unaudited. These are, um, we are in the middle of the audit with the CLA right now. We're having um, a successful conversation with them. And hopefully after tonight, many of the things that have been discussed and perhaps not understood or, or misunderstood will become clearer. Um, but we are, appreciate the opportunity to share the numbers we have tonight. So, Judy, I'll turn to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, I really um, enjoy this opportunity to try and to make better understanding of what fund balance is. I think there's a lot of confusion of fund balance, how we use fund balance, what happens at the end of the fiscal year with revenues and expenditure surpluses. So I'm hoping that I can clear some of those um, questions up this evening. I would like to start off, though, just to remind um, folks that we, the City of Portsmouth does prepare um, an annual comprehensive financial report every year. This is the June 30th of 2022. This information includes um, a statistical section in the back which provides a 10-year history of some um, good information on financial and demographic and econo economic information that might be uh, a good resource to people because it does give that 10-year history. Um, this document is also prepared following Government Finance Officers Association best practices and also implements all the required accounting standard boards, GASB pronouncements, and oftentimes we have to change our reporting and do new implementations in the financial, <coughs> excuse me, in the financial statements. Um, I would like to mention I'm very proud um, that we recently received a notice um, that the city received its 30th national recognition for this achievement of excellent financial reporting for this document, June 30th of 2022. Um, although this report is not mandatory to, repair, to prepare, um, it does follow uh, the GFLA best practices and it also, the city has made a commitment many years ago to continue these efforts in the spirit of transparency, which is very important to the citizens, and also um, provide good information to our investors of our municipal bonds. So um, I would like to start just a clarification and um, just hitting on what is fund balance. <clears throat> fund balance, um, by definition, is the total accumulation of operating surpluses and uh, deficits since the beginning of the local government's existing. So this goes back for many, many years. Every year we close out revenues and expenditures, and they close to fund balance. The term fund balance 
is used to describe the difference between the assets and the liabilities reported in governmental funds. And this is using the current financial resources. This is important because this is really basically looking at the financial statements as um, of the fund balance under um, what is current um, and how that the city could handle any current um, liabilities. So there's no reporting of capital assets such as land or building. And then the liabilities, there's no reporting of long-term liabilities such as uh, debt service. So the difference between the assets and liabilities are fund balance. There's five components of fund balance. There's a non-spendable um, piece. There's the restricted, which would incorporate grants and any enabling legislation up, up, put upon us. A committed fund balance are self-imposed limitations or our reserves. Assigned fund balance is encumbrances at the end of the year or funded use of fund balance for the next year. And then unassigned fund balance is not obligated or restricted for any uh, specific purpose. Uh, next slide. But we want to focus a little bit on committed fund balance and unassigned fund balance because these are two very important components of fund balance that our rating agencies look at, our auditors look at. Um, <clears throat> it is important to note that over the last couple of decades, we have made this commitment to implement um, stabilization reserves and other long-term financial planning policies to mitigate these large spikes in areas such as health insurance, such as leave at termination, and also to help manage the city's debt payment. Um, as you know, the city of Portsmouth has held a AAA bond rating from Standard & Poor's since 2013. The rating agencies look at many factors when identifying the credit worthiness of an entity and strong reserves held in the total fund balance is extremely important. These reserves are a very positive attribute to the city of Portsmouth here. The unassigned fund balance again, no, not obligated for um, any specific purpose, but the next slide. But we are committed to a fund balance ordinance, which is also favorably looked at by the rating agencies. This ordinance was amended in 2013, and what it says is that the city will maintain um, an unassigned fund balance between 10 and 17 percent of the total general fund appropriations. Now, again, this is an important factor with the city's bond rating. It's demonstrates how flexible a city is um, to withstand any unforeseen events such as storms or um, disasters or more recently in the last few years getting out of COVID-19 in the pandemic. Many entities were downgraded um, during this time of COVID and the city of Portsmouth was able to maintain that AAA bond rating. So where does fund balance come from? Well, again, it's the accumulation of operating surpluses and deficits from year to year. So um, conservative revenue estimates and budgetary flexibilities are also um, considered part of the rating. You want to be conservative with your revenue estimates, and you also want to be conservative with your expenditures as well. Now, um, many things happen during the year that we may have um, a higher revenue surplus than expected or a lower revenue surplus than expected. So many things happen throughout the year that will cause a change and maybe a slight trend going from year to year. If you look at this slide going from 17 to 22, and this, in this includes all audited fiscal years, revenue surplus has ranged be between 4.4 million um, and as low in FY20 as 1.2 million or 1% of the estimated revenues. Now this is an interesting fact because in FY20 was really when we were hit with COVID-19 and we were, uh, many communities as well as Portsmouth was concerned that if we were even gonna make our revenue stream. So this is, this is a, um, a, a good note here. Um, and again, expenditures, a surplus in um, also range usually typically it's about one and a half percent of expenditures is where you should fall in uh, to place if you look at fiscal year 22 this may help um, Rick Beckstead's question the 4.4 million dollars in um, expenditure surplus included the two million dollars from the skateboard park um, the, the skateboard park was 
um, a supplemental appropriation from the prior council uh, to use from unassigned fund balance. <coughs> when this council um, took office, made a decision to that that project really deserved to be in the CIP and um, for multiple reasons and one that it's probably going to be more than the $2.2 million. So um, it was, it was um, voted to retain 200000 of the $2.2 million and return $2 million back to fund balance. So that's why there was a large surplus of $4.4 million in expenditures in that year. <coughs> <coughs> so overall, again, um, looking at your total fund balance and a little bit of history from FY17, we've made, been able to maintain over 40% of your total fund balance, which includes your unassigned fund balance. This is a, um, a good measure because um, the, it um, demonstrates the, a good strength of the city in a financial basis. <clears throat> and a sign from balance. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, unaffined balance, we've maintained pretty much about 13.5% over the last several years. So this shows stability and a good, um, healthy unassigned fund balance falling within the range of the 10 to 17%. So what happens with the use of fund balance? Every year we talk about use of fund balance in the budgetary process. So there's a use of fund balance during the budget. Um, when we're putting together the annual budget, we use uh, some of our reserves, the use of debt service every year, um, and we use a, other committed fund balance in setting um, the, the budget for, for the fiscal year. After the fiscal year is adopted, this, there could also be a supplemental appropriation. So there could be a use of fund balance after that year, but in all together, um, use of fund balance offsets the taxpayers' tax rate. It goes back to the taxpayers by the use of fund balance in the next year. This chart demonstrates that from FY17 to 24, we've used $31.3 million of fund balance that was surpluses. This is an average use of $3.9 million. And if you look at it, every year we use, we use fund balance. This chart um, demonstrates how that offsets your taxes. So when we look at the, uh, the blue line, that is the tax rate when I go and set the tax rate with the DRA. So that includes the use of fund balance. Um, of course, I have not set the tax rate yet for FY24, so estimated at $16.13. The orange line demonstrates the differential if we didn't use any fund balance, if there was no surplus year after year after year on the, in revenues and expenditures, there wouldn't be any fund balance to utilize. So um, that shows that differential, the tax rate would be higher without being able to use uh, the use of fund balance. So it is my turn uh, to take over for Judy for a moment. And from year to year, there can be uh, intangible factors or um, things that don't happen in any given cycle, but that can have the effect of affecting the annual budget. Things that are considered um, as they come up and as deemed appropriate by management to bring to the attention of the council. And that would include additional services and demands. Think about programming and new space that we've uh, taken control of, be it community campus, the senior activity center. Uh, it also could mean an increase of areas uh, where the DPW has care and control, just as the gateways. There are new initiatives from time to time. As you recall, in March of 2022, we purchased the community campus. Um, there were efforts related to acquiring the McIntyre property. There was IT security needs that we needed to meet in a timely fashion. Uh, under technology, there are improvements that um, are over and above and in addition to security to stay current and to support our efforts to be resilient, redundant, and maintain business continuity. There's uh, regulatory compliance that may come up whether we've anticipated or not related to GASB pronouncements or legal support for a public records requests, which is currently um, weighing heavily on Susan and her department. Additional facilities that may come online to construct, to purchase, or to maintain. Um, a current one now that the uh, PPMTV folks have essentially moved out would be South Meeting House. That's a good example of that. 
in terms of capital projects, be it capital outlay or bonded projects, we have the ability from a management perspective to impact the timeline as we did smartly in hindsight with COVID. We, we proposed a drastic reduction and delay and now are bringing back a responsible restoration of those key long range programs. Collective bargaining was upon us in the last two years to have all 16 collective bargaining units come um, to be uh, settled. Uh, along with a once in a, ge a generation increase in, in inflation. All of these were in efforts to ret retain and recruit in a competitive environment and, you know, the economy and inflation and whatever it may do. So in the next slide, it's a really impactful slide. I shouldn't even talk. I can just say that this is a good representation of the challenges not only we face as a city when anticipating and keeping up with inflation. As you can see on the bottom, it's a little hard to read, but we're in be budget prep mode and then we see the effects of inflation. We go into budget prep mode again in FY22 when we were dealing with COVID, and you'll see the trend there. And we are mindful that just as households that need to manage their own budgets and be mindful of spending, we do the same thing, and we are always keeping our eyes to that. So with, uh, uh, very quickly, I won't read every bullet on here, but this gives, an, uh, gives you a sense of the things that we had to include and incorporate over the last four sets of two years, if you will, and you'll see the boxes in, in the bottom. But it speaks to uh, all the things that have come upon the plate of the city that were deemed appropriate by the councils to be implemented by staff. And um, the average increase is running at about 4.5% per year, which is the guidance that we were given for the budget year, which we're currently in. Judy, do you wanna to speak to the numbers? Um, yes, I just wanted to provide this history because there's a lot of numbers that are out there, out in print, out in, in public. And the numbers are the facts and the numbers stand alone here. But I think what's really important is numbers are only numbers, right? So everything that the city manager just went through, um, inflation, everything, all the challenges that we deal with, um, and even in the most recent years with the loss of one-time revenue that we had um, last year, is also a challenge when preparing the next year's budget. So numbers are great by themselves, but they tell a better story when <clears throat> it is a, when you understand the background and what is coming from these numbers. So um, again, they are blocked off in two years going back from FY17, but the total um, increase over the last two years so far is, is $11.7 million or 9.3%. This actually gets a little skewed too because COVID really brought the budget down and the budget was brought down specifically because we really delayed um, capital improvements, we, our, our programs were shut down, our recreation department was shut down. So, you know, when you look at this in the long term, that particular year was a challenge in itself, but it really skews um, the events going forward as well. This just demonstrates um, the difference between our budget, um, the proposed budget and our actual budgets in relation to the uh, Social Security um, Consumer Price Index. So the orange line is what Social Security, based on a calendar year, has um, been trending. And if you notice in FY24, we saw it start to spike, right, in 23 and 24, up to 8.7%. That's what the Social Security COLA adjustment was. The gray line is the Consumer Price Index from November to November, Boston, uh, Boston, Cambridge, Newton, and that is the CPI that we use in our collective bargaining agreements. We use a 10-year rolling average, but these are the actual uh, CPI numbers that it came in. And then, um, and to highlight what the budget increases were within those years in comparison to those other consumer price indexes. So they really have been coming in lower in most cases. Um, and again, in 24, at 4.34%, well below inflation. I'll take the next slide. It speaks to uh, FTEs that were hired in the general fund. And um, as recently as last week, we've heard lots of numbers bandied about and we wanted to make sure that people understood how we got to where we are. And this is also a good spot to remind folks that the proposed budget document um, is, is a proposed budget until it's adopted and then it's put into action. Um, initially it's put out citywide and it includes general fund which would impact the taxpayer along with uh, items that don't impact the taxpayer but instead the rate payer which would be special revenue and enterprise funds. 
to, to, to tell the story, and it, it's hard to read, but on the bottom total of actual 23, which is the second column from the right, uh, in reality, we did not fund all the proposed positions. So um, what is circled below is what is actually um, the number in reality. And um, I think this is a moment to say that staff takes seriously its responsibility to be able to implement and, and provide services to the community. So things that we do represent and request of council uh, don't come lightly. They come with lots of deliberation. We consider what we, we understand that the cost, uh, figurative and literal, of a, of a head a head and a head count. And so um, these are important, and we feel compelled to stand up for all of these. These are, these are my colleagues. These are folks who work as hard as I do, and you may see them more on the street. And these are the folks that provide services to the city. So I think I'll leave that there. So we, before we move on to um, the estimates for the FY23 uh, revenue and expenditure surpluses, um, I do want to reiterate that, again, we are in the middle of audit. The final ACFA report will be published and ready and submitted to GFOA by December 31st is the deadline. Um, so we're working with the auditors to get this wrapped up. It's a quick turnaround once we start um, with that process. And there will be some more detailed information on the budget to actual, but there's a lot of other financial statements in here that are just as important as this budget to actual. So um, the MDNA, which is the Management Discussion and Analysis Report, uh, in the ACFA will actually help explain in more detail. And then the auditors will be here in January to uh, present the results of the audit and the financial um, results for FY23. So because I was asked to provide some estimates, um, we, we are trending with revenue surpluses at about $4.8 million. Now, there was a couple of anomalies here. I mean, we did not really anticipate that interest on investments was going to go up as high as it did. We really um, were able to collect over like $1.1 $1 million in surplus just in, in investment income alone. Um, we also had, you know, $389,000 more in meals and rooms tax that when we put together the budget that we did not anticipate and that information wasn't available to us until later. So again, there are many factors um, in the revenues and those will be more clear um, when the, when the um, financial statements are complete. On the expenditure side, estimating $2.4 million of 1.8. Well, 1.8 is somewhere around the range that you want to be, one and a half to two, two percent on the expenditure side. Now, this is pretty much split between the operating and the non-operating side. We have seen a lot of vacancies in the last couple of years, which has really um, contributed to the surpluses on the on the expenditure side. Um, so, again. You know, we're hoping that with the collective bargaining that took place, you know, this this is going to change the future. We may not have as many vacancies going forward, so we'll just keep a, a watch on that in the future annual budget. So, again, it's about $7.2 million. The next slide um, is a, a repeat slide from up to the audited FY22 and then added the estimate here. And if you look, it's interesting in FY22, under expenditure surplus of $4.4 million. Again, that includes the $2 million of the skateboard park that was closed to fund balance. So if you take that $2 million out, you're right at the same level for those two years of expenditure surplus. Almost done. Almost done. <laughs> um, again, just here's where we uh, feel we're, we're lining up with the unassigned fund balance, basically staying the same. It's about 18 a million dollars and increase about a million dollars in unassigned fund balance. And then the total fund balance has like an increase to 41.8%, which is good. Um, it, it's about a $55 million total fund balance. Uh, my last slide here, I'm hoping that, <laughs> I'm hoping that this shows some clarity to what happens to fund balance. The bars underneath is your total fund balance. The top line is your net revenues and expenditure surplus. So we have 
when we say we have surplus closes to fund balance. So net revenue expenditure surpluses on the top, as you can see in FY17, when we close 17 budget, $5.5 million surplus closes to fund balance. The next year, $4.6 million closes to fund balance and so forth until we get to this estimate of, for FY23 of $7.2 million. Now the bottom line, it goes back to use of fund balance. So although we close surpluses into fund balance, we're also taking money out of fund balance to um, offset tax rates in the next year. So the bottom line you can see FY17, $4 million comes out, $3.6 million goes out, and goes back to the taxpayers in that way to help reduce the taxes. $7.2 million surplus, we knew that there was going to be a large surplus in preparing the FY24 budget. That's why it was okay to take um, use of fund balance of 5.3 to offset the taxes for FY24. Now this is not for dollar for dollar. This is an illustration trying to show how the money goes in and the money flows out. But there's still other factors associated with really closing out total fund balance because there's tax abatement, reconciliations, leave it termination. There's other factors that uh, uh, go along with that reconcil excuse me, reconciliation, but um, I just wanted to try to show a little bit more clarity to, to what happens with fund balance throughout the year. Thank you, Judy. Uh, we'll switch gears, and um, Ben's got a couple slides because the request was how did parking do in the last fiscal year, so Ben. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, City Manager Conrad, uh, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor McEachern, and, and Council for having me here tonight. Uh, quick look at the center column there. Uh, we came in at about an $8.3 million budget, and we were able to achieve 10.1 in actual revenues. Um, gives us a nice sur surplus for the year, which we added to our, uh, we're able to increase our fund balance uh, in, in, in the parking revenue fund. Um, by about six hundred thousand dollars, when we had been budgeted to spend about one point nine million out of that, so that's been uh, that's been a positive for us. There's a lot of factors involved in how that uh, how this all came to play. I'm happy to take any questions. I've also got quarter one uh, FY twenty four with me here. If anybody has questions on how we've done for the first three months of this year, do you feel the need to talk about that slide, or do we'll just leave it? In oh, the, packet? Uh, the the other question I th I received was uh, the cost of the restaurant parklets uh, for this summer. So. If you uh, just look at the quick synopsis and then you can go back and check the math, the uh, Zone A uh, 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 inventory delivered about $18.52 per space per day throughout the summer of uh, 2023, and you multiply that figure by 38 parklet spaces times 165 days between May 1st and October 12th, that renders a gross revenue loss of 116122.05 in parking revenues. But we did uh, collect 57000 from restaurants for the use of the space, so the net Revenue loss figure for uh, the summer of 2023 was 59155 cents. And Ben, if you want to give that sneak preview of uh, 24 to date. Sure, absolutely. So we're at 25% of the year complete. Uh, we're at 28% on revenues. So uh, there are no concerning line items here. Uh, the handover passes is slightly under, but uh, that's just due to the construction. Some folks have chosen to move down to uh, the foundry garage that uh, that hadn't made the choice previously due to um, uh, financial incentives that we put in place. So uh, we're, we're looking pretty good. Uh, the budget is 9.7 this year. I think we're going to have an, a, 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 a pretty good chance of meeting that and exceeding that. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions. And Your Honor and Council, this presentation is will be on the website if it isn't already. Thank you. City Manager Conard. Any questions? Councilor Bagley, uh, want to comment on the, we've called it a parklet now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like three years into this and we finally got the name for it. It's I've a got a couple of questions and comments, first for sure, Judy and going. then for Ben, if that's all right, Your Honor. Um, would it be correct to kind of the fund balance or the unassigned fund balance in layman's terms, would that be kind of considered a rainy day fund? It is, it is known as a rainy day fund. Um, I think in the state statutes they still actually mention that, but we've tried to get away from so-called rainy day fund. It is a savings. It is really for um, any use of, to back up for flexibility for emergencies and whatnot, but it is not designated for any specific purpose. So, and even on the committed fund balance, you know, committed fund balance is, is reserves 
but those policies can be changed. So, um, but it's the, the unassigned fund balance, yes. Okay, thank you. And I just want to comment once again and congratulate you and the team on the AAA bond rating. It's always tough when you're at the very highest rating because you can only go one direction and mm -hmm. that's the wrong one. Um, the other question I had is when you talk about positions that are unfunded, what that means in my understanding is say we have uh, 40 positions available in the fire department, but we only have 38 active firefighters because we just haven't hired for those two spots. That would be a a good example of an right. unfunded these, position? These positions are funded. They just have not been able to be filled. Okay. So, you know, and, and of course, throughout the year, people leave, people, you know, new hires, and so there could be some vacancies. But we've had a little stretch of long-term vacancies, um, both in fire and police, which has been challenging, and DPW as well. Okay. Thank you. And then um, a couple of quick uh, parking comments that I might already know the answer to, but I love bringing up. Uh, the percentage of on-street revenue that we're generating from Park Mobile now, do you have a rough number of that versus uh, uh, the meters themselves? Uh, yeah, about uh, about 50% of the revenue on 49% of the transactions. So it's the number one meter system we're in play right now. Excellent. And the um, number of residents that use Park Mobile versus the number of people that are visiting from out of town, do you have rough numbers on that as well? The the, uh, the usage of the app downtown is about 4% resident. So 96% non-resident. Correct. Thank you. And um, my understanding is all of these numbers, we've always kept the parking at the McIntyre lot completely separate from what we see before us tonight. It's That's a, correct. Okay. And then the last one, my understanding is for roughly every $500,000 in assessed value on a home, you're saving somewhere in the neighborhood of three hundred and forty. dollars uh, dollars off your tax bill between the services that the parking department provides downtown, such as snow removal, trash pickup, coast subsidy, as well as the $2.5 million to the general fund every year? $336 is this year's figure. Great. Thank you very much. Councilor Bullock. Thank you, Burr. Um, I have a question for um, Chief Blander. Um, I appreciate you explaining the um, the expenditure surplus from the two million from the skate park um, returning. Um, yeah, just as you explained it, it's so th that number will go back down to 2.4 million estimated in FY23. That's correct. Is that correct? Well, what I was trying to explain on that last um, page, it, the two million dollars was part of the surplus expenditure surplus in 22 is 4.4 million dollars, but two million of that was directly related to the. The supplemental appropriation that this council had um, voted to not use it from unassigned fund balance, yep. but to put it in the CIP. Yes, it gets closed back to a fund balance. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that recap and um, explanation. And uh, just one question for Ben. Um, I noticed the uh, budgeted for the Foundry uh, Place transient uh, was a little bit higher than what actually happened. Was there any reason for any explanation there or any? Well, we when it come, when we came out of COVID and we went started entering into the uh, Hanover project. So the Hanover project it has three a cap of three hundred spaces uh, at any given time that that can be um, utilized for the construction process. It took some time to ramp that up, uh, okay. but once it did, you know, and so so the so the people were still able to park at Hanover, gotcha. and that's obviously they're still their number one choice for for people who don't want to walk very far. But uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, so it evened out over the course of the year. Uh, but it's uh, actually Foundry is, is up in both of its revenue categories uh, compared to budget so far this year. Awesome. That's good to hear. Thank you. Council Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I have a question for our finance director, but I first wanted to say congratulations on a 30th year um, recognition for the CAFR. That's wonderful. Um, so you talked a lot about stabilization funds and um, I just want to make sure that this is clear for everyone at home who's listening. Um, we have a health care stabilization fund. We have a leave at termination stabiliz stabilization fund, and these all help us make sure we don't have large increases in the budget depending upon costs, um, if health care costs spike or if we have somebody who, who leaves and has accumulated uh, a lot of funds. But the fund balance also serves in essence as an overall budget stabilization fund in the way you've described it. Um, 
we put money in, but then we take money out to stabilize the budget on a regular basis. Is that pretty accurate? So when we talk about the, the reserves in, this, in the particular stabilization funds, the leave it term and health insurance stabilization funds are really part of the general fund. Yep. We just have like this sub fund where we pay for um, the expenditure piece out of each year. So as far as the budget um, pre preparing for the budget, we stabilized the amount of the budget, even though we may need more for health insurance or we anticipate we're gonna need more for health insurance, we stabilize that um, appropriation. Um, what happens with the reserve is the reserve is there that if we have a shortfall, because ultimately at the end of the year, those two sub funds zero out. So if there's a surplus in that, it will increase the surplus in the reserve in the fund balance. If there's a deficit, then it gets reduced. So at the end of the year, those two stabilizations zero out. Mm -hmm. But yes, it was originally to help because, you know, you, we budget in individual departments, fire, police, school, general government. You could have a reduction in health insurance premiums one year or a large spike in the next. And so what it was doing is allowing the individual departments, so to speak, have either a surplus or end up with a deficit at the end of the year. So it stabilized it all with the tax rate and it stabilized it within the individual departments. Thank you. Um, thanks, Your Honor. I, I had a couple of takeaways and, and again, congratulations on your award. Um, and thank you for this really valuable data um, I've gone cross-eyed over four years reading the CAFR and trying to understand fund balance. Um, it's this mysterious thing that sits up on the balance sheet, and this really helps make it clear um, and understandable. I, I wanted to f understand our fund balance position because when we did the budget, we knew we had to make some investments. We've invested seven positions in bringing IT in-house, and hopefully that creates more efficiency in the long run with better systems and more, <coughs> more self-serve opportunities for citizens, and I think that is going to happen. And we had to invest in school psychologists uh, who make a measurable difference, uh, social worker in the police department, which makes a measurable difference in, in sort of the, the, the call volume and the type of calls um, to split that workload. Um, and we knew that we we're going to lose some state revenue, so when the budget was presented to us, uh, we upped the amount of fund balance that we're going to use to five and a half million dollars. And I think the concern was at the time, are we um, getting into a pattern here where we're, we're tapping fund balance too much? And what's clear is uh, we will not only maintain but strengthen our fund balance. Um, it appears. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Um, the $7 million surplus, of which we're going to send $5 million back to the taxpayers to offset taxes, mm -hmm. saving us $0.81 cents in the tax rate or about five or $600 per household, um, How's our fund balance going to end up, do you think? Well, um, so when we prepared the FY24 budget, you know, we looked at what we were trending at then. The biggest issue, I think, with 23 is that we had nearly $3.4 million in the one-time revenue. So we kind of took $2.5 million of that use of fund balance to move into FY24 because we knew we had vacancies, we knew that it was we were trending as um, a, a large surplus. Now going ahead and we and we had discussions going ahead in FY25 that you know we're gonna we're gonna see where we're at. We're almost halfway through the year. Um, in January we'll be halfway through the year. Here we're starting the new budget process, and we'll take another look at where our trends are trends are at that point. But FY25, you know, we're, we're going to 
maintain the best possible fun balance without going too high. You don't want to go too high because then that is what you're doing is you really are overtaxing people, right? So you want to be able to stay at a level that um, achieves funding your next year's budget, being flexible in case of emergencies, and maintaining stability. Um, and that is what your rating agents look at. This is what your auditors look at just to see how um, – you know how you're how you're trending more the rating agencies than your auditors actually but um so when we start talking about fy25 we're going to look at some of the impacts that we're going to be facing and we'll do an analysis again of where we're falling in the current year budget yeah um and the other couple of takeaways you know we are trending as over time at about three and a half to four and a half percent increases in our appropriation authorized spending let's call it um, and it seems to be a steady fairly steady at that rate um, and you know four and a half percent given the inflation that we're in mm -hmm. um, is is actually holding below inflation in, in Social Security just came out to that um, in January that their color adjustment is going to be three point two percent for social security that's interesting yeah um and then the last thing that strikes me and maybe ben you have some thoughts on this um we're seeing very strong parking revenue we're f seeing very strong rooms and meals tax mm -hmm. and i have to associate that with a really healthy vibrant downtown and i wonder um it's not just people returning to portsmouth um to dine out and and enjoy the city as tourists but i gotta think um outdoor dining is is making a difference um with the i mean it would seem to show in the parking numbers and the rooms and meals tax any thoughts on that uh, you know without, without seeing the uh the, the rooms and meals numbers from the prior years before we had it uh, it would be difficult for me to comment my guess would be that that would, you'd see a, a fairly significant increase there uh, the reduction in parking revenues at the current pricing structure it being just 59,000 over the course of the summer uh, because it was offset by the sales of the uh, space itself uh, at the $1,500 rate for the summer uh, period um, did did help to minimize the the, the uh, revenue reduction impact there so um, I, I don't think it's going to affect us in, in achieving our numbers for the year any other questions on the presentation seeing none uh, thank you for the time that went into this uh, thank you uh, both Judy and Ben uh, congratulations again to Judy and your department um, thank you on the accolades well deserved uh thank you for a comprehensive look through uh on all of this thank you all right i think um yeah. we're going to take a five minute uh restroom break and then we'll be back um just before the hour thanks
Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. Councilor Tabor. Yes. Councilor Denton. Yes. Councilor Moreau. Yes. Councilor Bagley. Yes. Councilor Lombardi. Is he on? I see him on Zoom. He's muted, so. Council Blaylock. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. Mayor McEachern. Yes. Uh, I'd wait a motion to accept and approve the donation of the 1920 American La France fire truck to the Ports and Fire Department, subject to approval of the legal documents by the legal department. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Council or Assistant Mayor. I just think it's great. Um, I would like to thank the um, friends of Italian Americans for, you know, uh, facilitating this donation. Uh, and I know I spoke quickly to the chief on the way in, and I, I think it's just going to be a nice asset to our city. Thank you, Sister Mayor. Any plans on where this is going to be displayed? Maybe. Chief McCullen, you've, you've been here all night <laughs> waiting for this. <laughs> Don't act like it's such a far walk here. <laughs> uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the plan uh, the plan is to have the, uh, the, the truck housed at fire station number one, uh, where we'd be able to use it at parades, public events, and uh, fire prevention activities. Awesome. Well, look forward to it. And we will have a roll call vote uh, on this as soon as the is ready. I'm ready. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. 9 0. Thank you, guys. Love the nines. <laughs> now, going back to the, the, the order uh, as it was before, uh, we have public hearings uh, of ordinances. First, uh, public hearing, second reading of ordinance amending Chapter 1, Article 9, Conflict of Interest, Mandatory Financial Disclosure, Section 1.902, Election Candidate Financial Disclosures. Um, we have a presentation, but first I would await a motion to pass second reading and hold third and final reading at the number, November 13th, 2023 City Council meeting. So moved. Second. Okay. What is the, do we have a presentation? Uh, just brief brief comments. Yep. Um, these changes are coming forward from the Governance Committee um, after considerable um, deliberations and discussion and public comment taken um, at the Governance Committee. Um, the election disclosure changes really closed loopholes in our current election disclosures. Um, and they additionally provide more transparency by publishing our disclosures um, on the internet as well. And they, they also provide penalties for non-elected um, individuals, um, allowing us to file um, additional um, reports to the Office of the Attorney General for a non-elected official or for a political action committee um, that had not um, been included in our prior um, election uh, requirements and disclosures um, and the penalty had been just to go to the code of uh, the, the to refer to the code of ethics but unfortunately the code of ethics only applies to individuals that are serving so so we needed that additional um, level of potential penalty for violation council cook any further discussion or i guess that was just the presentation now uh, any city council questions? Comments. Councilor Dutton. Um, so first, I want to applaud the governance committee for this. A number of the what were amendments six years ago, I brought forward to this ordinance when it comes to political action committees and disclosure, including the disclosure of what's been spent on that election. Um, I think some of the amendments you made, I think all the amendments you made are great. Um, one of the ones that stands out most to me is the one that you spoke of last, which is the one that says what to do essentially if um, someone who's not an office holder or someone who's not running for office does violate this. It spells it out for you there. Um, there are three amendments where I'm just going to 
generally speak to now before public comment that I'd like to make to this. That way those making, those speaking during the hearing know that it's coming so not caught by surprise. Um, the first one would be one that essentially mirrors what's in the RSA that for all the campaign signs, advertising, and literature that's used that goes ahead and states the candidate or the PAC on it so people know who's making whether it's a physical sign or just a little um, handout card that goes to people. The second one is going to be for a full itemization, uh, not just the total amount spent on campaigns because if you see that a candidate spent, say, $1,800, it'd be good to know, all right, well, 900 that went towards signs and the remaining, whatever that is, $900 went towards a mailing. I think that would be useful, so that would be the second amendment. And then the third one, which probably most controversial, and what I tried doing six years ago and was unsuccessful, was to eliminate that uh, $100 threshold. So it's simply that all campaign donations are um, disclosed. So those are the three which I'm going to put forward after the public hearing. And if we do make any of those amendments, this will have to go back to public hearing at the next meeting. Thank you, Councillor Dutton. Any other City Council questions? Okay. Councillor Cook and then Councillor Bagley. Um, I think I also want to remind everyone who's watching at home that these election disclosures will not be in place for the current election, that they will be in place for the next set of municipal elections, so in two years' time, if they are passed. Councillor Bagley. That was going to be my comment, that there's no urgency because these would take effect from the next election, not this upcoming one. Any other Questions, Council Bola. I uh, just make a statement. Thank you, Honor. Um, I think any transparency, you know, any any um, of any money being involved in the elections, I think any transparency in, um, is going to make the election better and make it more clear. Um, you know, I hope that individuals are running as individuals, but if there are PACs involved, then uh, I think the public should know that. Council Bola. All right. It looks like we're ready to open the public hearing and hear from the public hearing speakers. So opened. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Page Trace, 27 Hancock Street. Um, in full disclosure, I'm running for city council this year. And about two years ago, the story starts that I did ask for all of the disclosure forms, which we all were required to fill out twice. Nobody likes to fill them out the second time. <laughs> and I applaud most of you for filling them out, um, particularly when you lose an election. You don't like filling them out. It's like the reminder. Um, I will say, though, that that most everyone up there did fill out the form, the second one. Um, and there were some PACs that actually did fill them out fairly, uh, fairly well. Um, Ports, or New Hampshire Young Democrats um, filled out their form, typed it out with the amounts um, as of prior to 11-2-21, but they submitted it 11-22-21, which was after the election. And they filled this out saying that um, a current candidate for uh, school board received $979.20. Um, the assistant mayor received $1,130.82. And the mayor received $880.56 as submitted to the city. Um, in full disclosure, I asked for these forms again, just to be sure. I had these forms when um, they were needed right after the election two years ago, as I said. Um, unfortunately, one of the three did not file the second form, according to the city. So there's no um, transparency 
on the part of the individual, the elected individual, on their second form. Now, I will say I will applaud the assistant mayor because she actually did fill out her second form. Um, unfortunately, the amount, um, which speaks to Councillors Cook wanting to have everything itemized, the amount that the assistant mayor filled out, having come from New Hampshire Young Dems, was $250 on the second form, which if you get the forms currently in a hard form or they get sent to you or whatever, you ask for them through an RSA, um, they don't jive. It's very difficult to follow them. And that would go far, as Councillor Cook said, to alleviating that issue. I'm sure that I would like to think that the elected official up there tonight who didn't file their second form, it's an oversight, either I didn't get it or they just forgot to file it. But that would go far to alleviating it, see seeing as most everyone up there, thank you, Councillor Tabor, um, although I will say, itemizing on a blank sheet of paper with no name on it, I'm sure you meant well, but, but it, it, it's, not, it's not exactly, how would you say, um, you know, it's not transparent if one sheet gets lost from the other. So I do believe that you are right, Councillor Cook. Um, I would like to know going forward the legality, and I would like to also, I'm not doing this to call out people specifically, but I am saying it's something to think about, and it's something to remind all of us that as much as we hate filling out the dreaded forms even this year, it's what we sign up for. So please, for the person who didn't fill out their second form, I would assume that you would provide it um, because two years later it still matters. And otherwise, I say thank you, Councillor Cook, for what you're trying to achieve. And maybe the wording is in the weeds a little bit. And sometimes less is more. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Or don't, please don't. We have enough difficulty trying to get it all in. So I thank you very much, and I'd like you to think twice before you vote on this tonight, because it's still not very transparent. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Uh, any other speakers? Peter Huda, 2A South Street. So, Councillor Denton, I, if I understand what you said and what, how you're going to add to what's currently we've, the rest of us saw tonight, um, the first thing you want everybody to do is detail all of their expenditures. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, contrary to the state RSA, you want everybody to report all of their contributions under $100, correct? And the last one, I didn't really understand. I think, was there, or was there only two? It would be a paid for by. Oh, paid for by. So I guess my question on the paid for by, if you paid for it three years ago, do you, is that going to be retroactive? And who would enforce all of this? That would be, that would be another question that probably needs to be answered. So uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, all detailed expenditures. Um, I don't, personally, I don't know the point of that. Um, a lot of us who self-fund uh, have all the, if, uh, if you're an accountant, you keep, all your, uh, you keep all your receipts anyway. And I don't know what the purpose this would serve. I guess um, that would be my question, and it would be a lot of work for every candidate. And uh, the uh, reporting anything under 100, uh, again, I guess is, that's contrary to the state RSA. I don't know what, what the point of that would be. If somebody giving a, uh, $10, $25, um, you know, what, what, what's the point and what's this going to solve? Um, I think uh, for clarification of what uh, um, Paige Trace was saying, when you look at 
what the reporting is for the individuals, and when you look at what the reporting is for a pack, they should match. So your first report, if it's um, $100, $100, the pack should have had $200. So they need to match. And if that's what she's saying did not occur, I guess the next question for, from my perspective as another uh, candidate would be who enforces this and where does it go next if this didn't happen? So um, just a question for you to ponder and uh, maybe Councillor Cook will want to put that in her uh, ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. I realize if those amendments by Councilor Dutton come forward, I'm assuming that it would require a second hearing given the questions about it. So I'm not going to go into detail because I'm still trying to figure that out. But I do believe that we should incorporate state RSAs in there, and I saw that that was knocked out. Um, I think that's important. I think we are under the state guidance first and foremost, and then uh, we go to local. The other thing is, Part of this is no one is really, it's not clear here who is a creator of that form if we take away the state form. And I think that should be part of your discussion and probably be put in the ordinance if we bring it back for another reading. Um, what body is creating that form? The last thing about individual, I'm fine with documenting any contributions. I think. What uh, Paige Trace has said is pretty clear that it probably should happen a little bit better. But I also think individually, you have the right to fund your campaign. Um, you have the right to do what you need to do. And I'm not sure where that falls in to an ethical issue. An ethical issue is who's bought you, who do you owe? In other words, who funded your cam campaign and who do you owe? And you know, I think that is why we have to write it all down. We have to show who has given us money, who has given us um, um, some kind of value with the potential of an expectation that there'll be a return on that value. I'm not sure if I'm funding it myself, I really have a return on my value. It's what I want to do and how I want to do it. So I don't know if that it makes a lot of extra work that really isn't the total um, concern here. Again, our concern here is who gave someone money, whether it was a PAC or an individual, how much did they give you, and how much is that worth in some other th something else, potentially? And I think that's what we're trying to figure out here with this. And I'm not sure if I gave myself money, if that really meets that criteria. But I would include the state information in there. I'm, I'm disappointed to see that go, um, 15A, RSA. And I would also ask that if uh, anyone votes on what um, Councilor Dan would like, that we come back for a second reading. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Any other discussion? Or any other speakers? Sorry. Any on Zoom? No, sir. Closing the public hearing. Any other uh, council questions or potential amendments? Oh, Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I wanted to clarify a few things for those at home because there were some questions raised. Um, first, the reason that form the form RSA 15A, the state form, was removed from the ordinance was not because um, <coughs> we don't want to follow state guidelines. It's because the form itself is confusing because it is not used. It's used as an example of what the state form looks like. Um, and since we don't use the form, it can be confusing to anybody who's reading um, our ordinance. They think that that's our form, and it's actually not. That's the state's form. Um, so we actually use forms that are um, designed by the clerk's office. And so um, the clerk maintains those forms and, and makes sure that the clerk receives them back. And that form was updated for the current election to make sure it follows the ordinance as written now. And so if changes are made, the form would be further updated by the clerk's office for the next election. 
Councillor Cook. Councillor Denton. Thank you, Your Honor. So I'm going to start by making an amendment for the paid by disclosure. So this would be to create a new paragraph F, which would read, all campaign signs, literature, and other advertising will state the candidate or PAC that paid for it, along with the fiscal agent and their address. There's a second, I'll speak second. to So that's the requirement under state law for advertising, for political signs, so whether it's a fiscal agent or a treasurer, that that's listed on the sign. And I would not, to answer the first question which was posed, I would not expect people who have signs from 10 years ago, eight years ago, six years ago, to get new signs. That's, that's wasteful. But over time, those signs will uh, stop being used. They get destroyed, whatever happens to them, and you'll have new signs made. When you have new signs made, um, the candidate should include that information on the sign. And then as far as policing goes, well, it depends on this is all based on the assumption that the amendment passes and that the amendments that were had the public hearing tonight passes. Um, if it's a candidate, well, they could be referred to the ethics board after the fact. If it seems blatant, if there was a brand new run of signs made by an experienced candidate, whatever else, that it didn't have a paid for sign, that could be done, or if it's a PAC. Um, under the ordinance, as what's in front of us, what we're looking to amend, um, it could be sent to the Office of New Hampshire Attorney General, or even if it's not in the ordinance, it could still be referred to the um, Office of New Hampshire Attorney General because it would be violating an RSA. I think out of the three things which I talked about, just having a simple paid for by on all literature, um, if you're not doing it this election, whoever runs the following election, this ordinance would mandate it for disclosure. A question yes. on that. Um, how? And I only remember this uh, because it was referenced by the Attorney General. Um, but individuals uh, have the right to anonymous speech. Is that is that correct? How would we work that in? Does, didn't Formella or the Attorney General John Formella say that uh, a former mayor was protected in his activities because he was an individual uh, or claimed to have acted as an individual uh, with the literature that he produced? So. I can't speak to those specifics or that opinion, but if you look at the RSA itself, and this is RSA 664 colon one form political advertising, sets that advertising must include the name and address of the candidate and his fiscal agent or chairman, if not the candidate of a campaign, and the name and address of the treasurer of a political committee or natural person who is responsible for the advertising. So. The natural person, I guess, would have been the former mayor, and under the current statute, they should have provided the paid for by. So maybe the statute's invalid, or maybe they didn't look at the statute when they made that decision. But the reason why I worded it a little bit different is in our definition of PAC, we say, um, is any person or a group of people raising and spending money. So that covers the difference in the statute. And I'm open to changing the language here, but I think it would be help. Okay, but regardless, it would have, it, we can, as, as defined, this would have required if there's signs that are going up to see who's paying for them. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councilor Murrow. I guess what if, so if I'm running and I have my name on my sign and I paid for it, you want me to put my name on my sign twice? A little paid. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, it, it's, if there isn't something there, could there be a way an exemption, the assumption is it was paid for by that person? That is common sense. <laughs> that is not what the law currently says. So if you look at any candidate signed for state rep, state senate, governor, even if it says, I don't think there's a John Smith running, John Smith for governor, it'll say paid for by John Smith or paid for by um, committee to elect. John Smith. It's it's silly, but it's little font on signs. Mm -hmm. Councilor Bagley. Thank you, Your Honor. And maybe to kind of piggyback off of Councilor Murrow's concerns, if this were to pass, I would hope we'd include the language from Section 664 colon 14, and 
item number eight, which applies to local elections according to state statute. Political advertising in the form of signs or placards may contain an internet address in lieu of the signature and identification requirements of this section if the internet, internet address is printed or written in size or lettering type large enough to be clearly legible and the website immediately and prominently displays all the information required by this section through election day. And I'll send that to the city clerk afterwards. But I think if we're going to try and make an ordinance for the city, we should use the verbiage that is in the state RSA. So it's very clear um, to Councilman Monroe's point that we do in fact have to put paid for by Andrew Bagley and then a website address or my home address on the sign, which may be a bit redundant, but that's what the statute calls for. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I think that anything we do that increases transparency um, improves our elections. So I, I think it's actually a positive idea to move forward with this particular change. Um, it's something that I personally was concerned about enough this year that I printed out stickers to put on every single sign that say paid for by Kate Cook for city council and give my web address so that it's it's clear to everyone who who signs those are and who paid for them. So um, so I was particularly concerned about following this RSA and I think it's um it's by bringing that into our local ordinance it also makes it clear to all candidates that we don't just follow our local ordinances but we follow state law as well and that we should follow state law. I actually have a question for either the city manager or the city attorney to make this um, simple or simpler and seeing as the next meeting isn't until um, I think November 17th or so. 13th. 13th. Would that be enough time if I withdrew my motion and motioned that we send these three concepts to the legal department that they come back with verbiage in time to have a second um, a second reading and public hearing with proposed amendments with these proposed amendments that so would be the new amendments to well I think we're at least going to get the sign one done so we should probably just have them all with proposed amendments or reasons why they wouldn't be feasible or legal yeah. mm -hmm. is that seem like it works for Councilor Cook? Um, Your Honor, I think that that is reasonable. My real question here is should we discuss the other two as well to make sure that we're not asking legal to do work that is um, that may not may not pass count? I will withdraw my amendment so we can have the other discussions and then refer whichever ones the council chooses to the city attorney. Does the seconder agree? Yes. Thank you. All right. So, Councilor Dunton. The other two, the first one is for the itemized list of expenditures. And the reason, and this is to speak to the uh, comments made during the public hearing and why I think this is important, is the only way you can line up what is donated and what is actually spent is knowing what it's spent on. Because otherwise, the system would simply be, well, they're saying they um, receive, let's say, $500, and they're saying they spent $500, but there's no actual, like, hey, it's broken down, 250 for signs, 250 for literature. There's really no telling if that's the amount they actually received in donation. And these are small figures here, but I think it's just important for disclosure. And also it helped people know if they want to run for city council, like, oh, it costs $1,000 the first time to get signs and literature made. Maybe it'd be imposing, they'll start raising money early, or maybe it'd be like, oh, it's not that scary, I can do it. I just think it would be a helpful thing to do if we had, um, if we mandated an itemized list of expenditures. And even for people who self-fund, um, it'd be good for people to know because if the, you say you're self-funding, and that way, you're, no one, you don't owe anything to anybody. The only way you could really show that is, well, I spent this much money, and this is um, what I spent it on. 
Any discussion? Councilor Bagley? Thank you, Your Honor. And I'll, I'll support this amendment in concept if it comes back as feasible uh, for, for one reason and one reason only. I think local elections are very different from state and national elections where the barrier to entry to get elected is far, far cheaper than it is at the state and national level. And I think the best way to showcase that and level the playing field, especially for people that aren't incumbents or people that were previously incumbents, so for, for newcomers, is for them to look at different candidates and say, okay, this person spent $1,200 and this is how they spent it. This person spent $2,500 and this is how they spent it. This person spent $500 and this is how they spent it. What this does is it lowers the barrier of entry for new candidates. And I think we, anything we can do to encourage people to run for local office can only make our community better. Uh, Councilor Tabor? Yeah, I would support this too. Um, uh, I, I actually did do all this disclosure on my form. I lined out each of my spending items direct mail, web hosting, and the amount, um, because I think it, I just felt nobody should have any question of what a candidate spends. It should be clear and, and, and in the light of day. Um, and um, so, and, and I think otherwise it is, it is mysterious. You, you can't tie out how much was donated to, how much was spent, and um, how much was self-funded and where it went. So um, it seems very really simple to, to ask for um, the spending detail. Mm -hmm. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I agree with Councilor Tabor. Um, I think that this just increases transparency further um, into election spending locally. Um, it makes it clear for everyone who's um, going out to vote, um, how people have spent money on the campaign. I know there are always concerns about, you know, where's the, the money going? What are people doing with this money? And making it really clear to our voters, I think, is really critical um, because then they can understand local elections better. And, and I also like this for a bigger picture as well. Um, I'm concerned about long in the long term what spending looks like in local elections, uh, about increasing um, state or national influence and making sure that we kind of we can see um, where money is actually going in those elections in the long run. Looks like you're two out of three so far, Councilor and Denton. The third one, which is likely more controversial, is eliminating or at least lowering the $100 um, or more threshold of what needs to be disclosed. And the goal is not to discourage people from donating small amounts. The goal is to make sure everything adds up. Uh, because you could have a group of 10 people donate $99 to one candidate, and that's essentially $1,000 which funds the campaign. But that, whatever that math is, uh, $990 does not have to be disclosed. And if we're now requiring, uh, ideally, you know, not just the total amount spent, but the itemized amount spent, that will be a $990 hole in the picture. So if we actually want to do full disclosure, it would make sense. And again, we don't have to, if allowed by law, we wouldn't have to, like I want to do, uh, say, hey, every donation should be disclosed, but at least lower it from $100 to something, I don't know, $25. And again, like my biggest donors are usually my parents to my campaign, it's a birthday gift. But um, it's something which I would want to have seen done for years now. Um, I understand it might be controversial, and I think it's worth asking legal, can we even do this, if there's a question in the public? Your Honor, uh, Council Lombardi has his hand up. Council Lombardi. Uh, yes, I, in, Speaking about disclosure, um, there's just another piece in this that we've changed, and that is uh, number H under this, and just that uh, this will be published on the city website as well. Uh, people can, uh, can have access, easier access to this data. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's good. I'm uh, 
self-funding candidate. Um, and I have to think about what I've spent my money on because um, I hadn't thought about web hosting, for example. I hadn't, uh, you know, so I have to, I have to include that. Anyway, uh, so that's my comment now. Thank you. Thank you Councilman Brody. Uh, Councilor Cook and Councilor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm I'm in favor of changing the hundred dollar limit and lowering it, um, or even eliminating it. And um, part of the reason that I'm in favor of this is I think that it's important to know who is donating to campaigns in the city. And whenever you have a limit, people have a tendency to kind of brush up against that limit. Um, for example giving $99 instead of $100 so that they're not, their names are not disclosed or so that a candidate doesn't have to disclose that. And, and that really, to me, goes against the spirit of the rule. Um, I find that I, I am a candidate that has accepted donations. And what's fascinating to me is that people in Portsmouth know that donation limit, um, and I've never said it to anyone. I, the, the donations that I will be disclosing um, from this election are from family and friends that live out of town um, because they don't know that we have a $100 donation requirement of, of listing their names on a disclosure form. So they, they'll give me $100 or give me $150. Um, and they're the ones that have, that are least impacted by decisions made by this council because they don't live here. In fact, um, some of them live far out of state. So, um, but they're my family, so they care about me. The local donations that we receive are often under $100 because of that donation limit. Um, and that keeps people's names from being disclosed. And I, I don't think that that's reasonable because that's exactly the issue of transparency that we're concerned about. Councilor Bagley. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. And I, I agree with this in principle, and I hope legal can find a way for this to happen. And the reason is, I, I think there's a perception um, that you know somehow people are buying our votes with you know big donations and and i think if we can just go out there and print you know i got 25 dollars here i got 12 dollars here i got 50 dollars here i think people would understand better that you know nobody's changing their vote over a 12 dollar donation it's just kind of a show of support and i really like the change uh, that Councilor lombardi mentioned about it being on the website um, i think in the old days these things used to get printed in the newspaper the newspaper you know, because of the way newspapers are these days, don't print as much data as they used to. So I, I think we should publish the lowest amount of donation as possible, and I, um, I think it should be on the city website so people can look at that if there's ever a question. Assistant Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, um, I agree with this in theory. I think that there are residents that don't want their information posted, and so this is a great mechanism for them to participate in local elections with and exercise to some degree their First Amendment right, which includes the the freedom not to speak or not to be publicized. So I would I would be concerned that you it would put some residents that, that don't want their name on a list, uh, that don't not want their name on the website. And as someone who works two jobs and heavily relies on, as we heard tonight, heavily relies on donations, and I'm okay with that to be able to make my campaign uh, and still meet ends meet. I, I I worry that we are we're pushing it a little bit on, on this envelope in that. I think we need to allow people the protection sometimes of anonymity. And it and it does allow for me it speaks really loudly when when a donor writes me that hundred dollar check when they are local because they that is their way of not only supporting the campaign but publicly supporting the campaign. But that does not increase their value versus someone who only does a $99 or $50, $25 donation. So that's where I, I would be concerned is that you are, um, are you then to some degree discouraging people who do not want their name publicly printed in the newspaper or on a website from uh, playing a part in their local election? Councilor Moreau. I understand both sides of this argument, and I go back and forth in my head, so I'm, I'm drawing up a compromise, and I don't know if the legal side of it will agree or not, but maybe they can look into it. What if under whatever that amount is, there are anonymous donations and we just report them in total? We got anonymous donations all 
under a certain dollar amount but totaled this amount so that if we are doing reporting of expenditures, it shows where that money, you feel like it's on both sides of the balance sheet, so to speak, right? So I don't know if that's allowed, but maybe legal can look into that and see whether or not that could be a solution to allow people to still donate up to a certain amount anonymously, but we still have to report it as, you know, I got however many dollars from people that were all under this amount and they were anonymous and maybe you say it's 10 people or five people or whatever the case may be. Just a thought. So it sounds like we'll get some Weeble feedback on the limits around donations. You know, I think it is, uh, um, I think it will be difficult to uh, figure out a way that, you know, as Councillor Denton pointed out, you know, if there's 10 folks and I got to remember the math, $990 uh, could be significant. Um, but I, you know, I'd like to hear back from Weagle before we're able to um, identify, you know, what um, we can do on that. But I, you know, I'd probably be the vote for more um, disclosures if possible. I'd like to have it in some sort of electronic form at some point, um, both for a reminder for candidates, uh, but also the public to be able to easily see. Uh, an electronic form would probably be, you know. We got an IT department now, so uh, that would be fantastic if we could make that happen. City Attorney. So, um, from what I'm understanding, the one real legal issue is whether we can require itemization of every donor, even under $100. But the other two proposed changes are not so much legal issues, and I would perhaps recommend that you go ahead and vote on those amendments tonight so that we would have a better form um, for publication uh, for the second reading to make sure we make our deadlines. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's no deadlines, I guess just because you know, the deadline of the end of the, the council term. Um, but if we could have a uh, uh, vote to support, um, uh, I guess the, qu the question is that we are, um, we're going to have to uh, have another second reading regardless, even after the next one, I'm assuming, because even if we advance, we're going to still have a third, we're going to still have a third second reading. Is that... That's my understanding, because these will be substantial changes that they're not, um, unless we pass them all uh, at the moment and then came back. So if we passed all of three of Councillor Denton's amendments this evening and they would go into a legal form uh, for the ordinance for the following meeting, we could then pass second reading and move on to third reading at the next council meeting. Barring that, if we're just going to get language back that's not in the actual ordinance, it's going to have to have two uh, second readings or two more second readings. Is that clear to everyone? Right, and you only have three more meetings. Oh, that's the, there it is. That's, that's the, the kicker. That's, that's the time <laughs> so. that I'm looking at. I mean, you could do it with an amendment you know, to vote for all of those amendments and the legal can report back if there's an issue um, or. Okay, so I do think that there's a, there's a feeling that as long as it's legal, the, maybe that doesn't have the support of the whole council, but enough to pass it. So my thought, if I may, would be I could work on the exact language for these and only one of them there's a legal question for right. but I'd still like to send the language to legal just to look at not for legal just I guess proofreading or make sure I'm not doing something you more than copy editors but to make sure it jives with everything else and I know we would have to have something um, published for second reading by a certain deadline, but if I had something to you in the relatively near future, I would think we could still meet the deadline to have a second 
reading a public hearing on it if we published it. You're yeah, there's no problem with having a second reading. Yeah. Just, but the problem is, it, and it's not a problem. We can have, we'll have three more council meetings. The second, we'll have the second hearing where we will amend this one with that proposed language. We will then have the next council meeting be another uh, meeting to have second reading because those will be a substantial change and we'll have to have a second reading. And then we'll have one more meeting left. Uh, so as long as uh, there's, you know, only, you know, if there's not other changes that we come across, and I can't promise that there's not, given, this, <laughs> given our group here, but the, uh, we, could, we could find out uh, another change at a future uh, meeting, and it could go on to another uh, second reading. But if, if you want legal to review, I think the motion should be to review the legal changes that I have, uh, that I have presented and come back with language that would be appropriate for amendments at the next and we'll delay the vote on this public second uh, reading to be a uh, date certain on the 13th. So moved. Second. Any discussion, Councillor Cook? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Can we try to reach some agreement in principle on the number that we're looking for, the financial number we're looking for for disclosure if we were to say go with Councillor Moreau's suggestion of a compromise? Um, the reason I'm asking this is that it gives legal more guidance and Councillor Denton more guidance on language um, for that third proposal um, coming back um, if if that is the direction we're going or let's have a little bit of more discussion on that to make sure that we're giving some good some good guidance to the legal department um, because they could come back right now with about five different versions of language on that second proposal Councilor Denton? So I like both ideas, both mine, obviously, and Councilor Moreau's, if mine were to fail. So I thought would be, regardless, include language in here stating that, I guess, have ready language that all donations will be, um, the cumulative total will be listed. Because that language would apply either I way. And then there'd be additional language stating details. that it will be uh, detailed by amount. Okay. So no matter what hers, I think, is going to pass. Councilor Moreau's, it's a great idea. Whether my idea of eliminating the zero, whether it's legal or not, that we're not sure of. But I think Councilor Moreau's language will. Okay. I think I have a good idea of the issues that you've all presented for us to look into. One question. Assistant Mayor. Would this um, include any self um, contribution, like any, would you be listing that under, or would you just list that under expenditures? I guess is what I'm saying. Would you, would you list it as in I donated $1,000 to, my, to myself, or would, because that could again leave that gap so for that very reason, I think it would make sense to have the candidate write, I donated this much, because then that you could say, okay, that's the gap that's missing. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to make that clear, because I, I feel like we left the, that was kind of left out in the open. Mm -hmm. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I think there's also another element here that um, people need to consider for those individuals who have run more than one time, there will probably be some discrepancy because you may have additional funds that are unspent from a prior campaign that are sitting in an account. So I think that that's, that's important to remember. Um, okay, Legal, do you have what you need? I believe I do. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Attorney Thank Morrell. You. Um, so we're voting to send uh, uh, the uh, motion as presented from Councillor Denton to uh, include the his amendments uh, delivered to legal uh, for the uh, second second reading of this uh, ordinance change. Ready, ready. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? 
Yes. Council Blaylock. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. Mayor McEachern. Yes. Zero. Thank you. Next up, public hearing, second reading of ordinance amending chapter one, article four, section 1.413, sustainability committee. I'd wait a motion to pass second reading and hold third and final reading at the November 13th, 2023 city council meeting. So moved. Second. Is there a presentation? I will be brief. This simply codifies the blue ribbon practices committee on sustainability into a standing committee. Great. Any discussion? Any questions? Opening up the public. Oh, <laughs> Councilor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, this is a really important move for the Sustainability <clears throat> Committee after functioning for many years because they will be adopting a climate action plan that they'll send forward to the council. Um, this gives them the opportunity then to implement all the recommendations um, and the work that they've done on that climate action plan as a standing committee. We will now, oh, Councillor Tabor. Um, one of the questions would be, how would the Energy Advisory Committee uh, work with the new Permanent Sustainability Committee? And we're having those discussions now. Um, I think the Energy Advisory Committee, because it has people with a lot of expertise in utilities, uh, solar, wind, all of those things um, is going to be a very good resource and uh, I think let's pass this and then um, in the new year we'll, we'll reappoint the Energy Advisory Committee and, and have them take on some of the tasks of the Climate Action Plan. Mm -hmm. Opening up for public hearing. Public hearing speakers on making the Sustainability Committee a standing committee. Closing the public hearing. Any additional council questions or deliberations? We will have a vote when you're ready, Val. <coughs> Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Morrow? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McKechnie? Yes. 9 0. Your Honor, I motion that we suspend the rules to bring forward for third reading the ordinance in front of us. Second. Okay. Bell, when you are ready. I'm trying. Oh, I know. I was just trying to throw <laughs> the silence there. Thank you. <laughs> Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Passes 9 0. Next up, our third and final reading of ordinances. Uh, third and final reading of ordinance amending Chapter 7, Article 3, Section 7.321. Snow Emergency Parking Ban in Chapter 7, Article 10, Towing, Section 7.1002, Snow Removal Operations. I'd wait a motion to pass third and final reading of this ordinance. So moved. Second. Councilor Cook. Uh, Your Honor, did we just pass third and final reading of sustainability or just suspend yes. the rules and bring oh. forward? We only suspended the rules, well, I think. Oh, uh, darn it. The broke oh, right. <laughs> uh, we were Jumping gonna... ahead of ourselves. <laughs> okay. We will go back and await a motion to pass third and final reading of sustainability committee changes. So moved. Second. Okay, got it. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Council Tabor? Yes. Council Denton? Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Uh, next up, uh, the third and final reading of ordinance amending Chapter 7, uh, Article 3, Section 7.321, Snow Emergency Parking Ban, and Chapter 7, Article 10, Towing, Section 7.1002, Snow Removal Operations. Wait a motion to pass third and final reading of the ordinance. So moved. Second. 
Any discussion? This is to remind folks that there are going to be some changes to that. Um, and it's probably not going to snow at all now that we've made those changes. But yes. Now, when you're ready. Assistant Matt Kelly. Yes. Council Tabor. Yes. Council Denton. Yes. Council Morrow. Yes. Council Bagley. Yes. Council Lombardi. Yes. Council Blaylock. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. Mayor McEachern. Yes. We're on to uh, third and final reading of ordinance amending chapter one, article eight, code of ethics, section 1.802, conflicts of interest, amending subsection F, gifts and favors, no office or officer or employee shall accept any gift over $100 per calendar year. We wait a motion to pass third and final reading of the ordinance. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Bagley. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm gonna vote opposed to this because I don't agree with the definition of family in Section F. Okay. A roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. Councilor Tabor. Yes. Councilor Denton. No. No. Councilor Moreau. Yes. Councilor Bagley. No. Councilor Lombardi. Yes. Council Blaylock. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. Mayor McEachern. Yes. Pass the seven two. On to the city manager. All right, I'll be brief. Thank you. Uh, the first request is a request to sell surplus water meters. There's a picture. There are pictures in your packet uh, of metal, uh, meters that are for which we have no use. They're outdated. It is the opinion of the water department that their greatest value would be a scrap metal, and the bundle value is uh, believed to exceed the $500 limit, uh, beyond which we must seek council approval for surplus and disposal. Uh, we have found that in the past, Gov Deals has yielded the city the more money um, than through a sealed bid process and as such we are recommending that we move to authorize the sale of the surplus equipment as presented with gov deals we a motion to authorize the sale of the surplus equipment as presented so moved. Second. second roll call vote please assistant mayor kelly yes council Tabor. yes council denton yes council moreau yes council bagley Yes. Council Lombardi. Yes. Council Blaylock. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. Mayor McCucker. Yes. That's nine zero. Item number two is a request for a temporary construction license for the uh, building known as the Pierce Block. There's a very patient gentleman from Carino Construction that was here. I don't know if he's just, still here. Just left. Just left. Well, um, <laughs> the request of the applicant uh, is to per, uh, seek permission to extend the current encumbrance permit beyond November 15th, uh, which would include two license areas, 1,368 square feet of sidewalk and a small portion of roadway along High and Ladd Streets. Um, this, the area over which is not passed through staging. And the second area is the six parking spaces along High Street, not to be confused with the six spaces that have been discussed previously in other projects. So the total license fee for the period to go to run from November 16th through January 30th, 2024 for 76 days is $27,998.40. Legal Planning and Public Works have reviewed and approved this request. <coughs> we wait a motion to move that the city manager be authorized to execute and accept the temporary construction license to encumber the sidewalk and roadway along High and Lad Streets and six parking spaces on High Street that abut the Pierce Block as requested. So moved. Second. Um, so they're encumbering, I know that what they're encumbering are, so they're completely blocking off the parking spaces and the sidewalk along High Street so that there'll be no public access whatsoever, even like a portion of the parking spaces to walk along there. I just, is that I know the we will make accommodation if they cannot uh, traverse one side of the sidewalk. I'm looking to Suzanne or Peter to see if they can clarify. I just want to make sure everyone at home understands how they should walk through or maneuver that area while this is going on. It's Mayor, City Council, Peter Rice, Director of Public Works. Um, the initial proposal was to have walk under um, uh, scaffolding. Uh, however, upon review with the contractor, um, it was deemed to be uh, probably unsafe uh, because of debris. Uh, including um, 
myriad, uh, washing materi uh, materials off the side of the building. Um, the staging goes into the parking spaces because the the width of the uh, sidewalk, so that it makes it makes it uh, Im really impractical both to have uh, protected staging and parking in the same spot. Um, so we did explore. Uh, continuing uh, both parking and uh, the pedestrian access, uh, but it just was not um, deemed safe. If I might. So will the public have to go on the other side of the street in order to get around that Correct, way? yep. But that will be open, because I know there's Yes, other... the other side of the street will be open. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> thanks. Councilor Bagley. Yeah, thank you, Honor. Uh, this is an area of parking that we've looked at for other projects. So I just want to be clear that this is the side of the street that Starbucks is on and they have to do some repointing of the brick and maintenance that you have to do to very old buildings to make sure that it continues to be safe. Um, so unfortunately we're going to lose the project, uh, the parking for this project, but it has nothing to do with any of the new projects that we're also investigating on the other side of the street. And I am happy to see that we will be, um, the license fees will accommodate any lost parking revenue from those spaces. Council Lombardi has a question, Your Honor. Council Lombardi. Thank you, Mayor. I um, just want to make sure that fire and safety can get through there adequately. We, uh, as, a, as a way of reviewing the request, we make sure that that <coughs> takes place. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Council Tabor? Yes. Council Denton? Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Uh, zero. Thank you. Items three and four uh, could be taken together with your approval and indulgence. And the city manager's information item number one, the only item on tonight's agenda, helps to mm -hmm. set the background for that. So if I may, I'm going to ask Principal Fister. Uh, Roseanne Lentz to come up and wrap all three together, if that's, if that, that's all right, by the council. Sure. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. So I'm reporting back on a request that Council Cook had to explain what was going on with renewing and revisiting all the exempt properties in the City of Portsmouth. So as background, um, this past three years, there's been some cases through the Superior Courts and the Board of Tax and Land Appeals taking into question how exempt properties were being reviewed and approved by various <laughs> municipalities around the state. A significant one was by the Board of Tax and Land Appeals where they went in and they decided that the assessor or the Board of Selectmen were not doing their due diligence when approving these exemptions and they were actually taking them away from the charitable and the religious organizations and making them go back and pay taxes for prior years. So the assessors got really concerned about this because not only did the Board of Tax and Land Appeals rule on this, the Department of Revenue Administration now took it to a different level and started sanctioning the assessors and the selectmen for how they were approving these properties. So for this year to protect our exempt properties, I decided to review all of them again. The last time they review, reviewed fully was back in 2002, so over 20 years ago. Annually, they do file an application by April 1st, um, I mean by April 15th as they're standing April 1st. They don't have to provide all the documentation they did when they initially filed. But as we all know, things change, so I asked them to refile all their initial doc documentation. And I would really like to compliment our exempt properties and thank them for their cooperation because it was an arduous process and um, it was a lot of documentation. So I, I, I can understand they're concerned. So going forward, there's still going to be a process of providing documentation, but it's going to be up to the assessor because statute allows us to request anything we think is necessary for them to qualify for these exemptions because they are, um, the taxpayers are supporting them by them requesting these exemptions. So I feel it was necessary not only to protect the exempt properties, but to assure the Portsmouth taxpayers that these are truly exempt properties and they are doing their charitable purpose for our community. So with that, 
we have a couple of pilots that have come forward. One of them is Betty Dream, who has had a standard pilot with the city of Portsmouth for a, a number of years. So their request this year is for $3,000, which I would recommend approval for. The next one was uh, Friends of Lafayette. In prior years, they were filing under a charitable uh, status. This year, after the review, it was determined that they need to file under a different statute, which is RSA 7223K, which states that an organization that provides um, services for disabled home group homes pay, would request a pilot payment from the city of Portsmouth. Because this year it was a surprise to them, my recommendation would be to leave it as they were at paying no taxes for this year or not a pilot payment for this year. And next year review both Betty's Dream and Lafayette, uh, Friends of Lafayette, to try and come up with a um, more consistent um, pilot payment for not only them but for anybody else requesting it in the future. So everyone is treated the same. I did make some recommendations this year, but looking at it, it was a surprise. It would be a surprise to Betty's dream. So I think I would like, if you don't mind, to recommend keeping Betty's dream at $3,000, keeping Friends of Lafayette School as not having a pilot payment for this year, and then going forward next year, negotiate with, with them again and try and come up to um, something that they can live with and the city can live with. And, and go forward from there and apply it consistently through anybody else that requests this type of payment. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roseanne, for all the work that you've put into this and yeah, for the recommendations. Yeah, I'd like to thank Susan also because we were going back and forth with one another <laughs> on this. So it was a couple of us that working with these exempt properties. So, and again, I would truly like to thank them all for their cooperation this year. It was a really, deal, it, it was really a, a tremendous process for them to go through. Well, uh, it's, a, it's appreciated that you were willing to, to help them through that process. Uh, we're all richer for it uh, in the city of Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. Councilor Cook, question for Roseanne uh, or otherwise? Thank you, I, I just wanted to say thank you also for the report back on how this process has changed mm -hmm. and how it, um, it, it has been a little bit more cumbersome because of the changes at the state level. Um, I really appreciate that explanation. Um, I think that that's Im an important takeaway that we can um, use to explain to our nonprofits why this has changed, why it's a little bit more challenging now, but in the future, um, it'll be much easier for them to update their paperwork. So I, I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. What? Oh. Just, just one comment is that, um, the reason that there still needs to be an agreement, a pilot agreement, even though we're agreeing to zero dollars for Friends of Lafayette, is because under the statute, without the pilot agreement, there's a substantial tax imposed on the, um, on the group. So with the pilot, then you have a specific zero sum. That's why you need that. Thank you, attorneys. Um, and the city attorney, spoke to my concern, which is RSA 7223. Uh, if we didn't have a pilot agreement, would require either 10% of rents or the, the entire non-school portion of our tax rate. Which I are substantial sums. Very I burdensome. Think we had calculated that at one point. I don't know if you have the numbers in front of you. Um, I do. So if we did, um, like for Betty's, what is this Betty Street? For Friends of Lafayette House, the 10% of the shelter rent would have been about $23,000. And it's considered still a pilot. Um, and then the uh, municipal portion of the tax rate would have been about uh, 6700 So there's big differences in these numbers um, for these organizations. Right, and I, that's why I would totally support what you propose to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Councilor Bagley. Thank you, Your Honor. And I, I agree with um, Councilor Tabor. I support this. This is a, These are two organizations that provide um, much needed housing for members of our community that would not be served otherwise. And I think this is a very reasonable and 
thoughtful accommodation to get everything back together and in, in, in order, but in a way that is not um, unduly uh, heavy burden. Any other questions? Thanks so much, Roseanne. Thank you. Good great. evening. Yeah. If we could go back to the order of the program here. Uh, we're on item number three um, with a request that I be authorized to enter into a pilot agreement with Betty's Dream in the amount of $3,000. Move that the city manager be authorized to enter into the pilot agreement with Betty's Dream, Betty's Dream in the amount of $3,000. So moved. Second. Roll call vote, please. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Council Tabor? Yes. Council Denton? Yes. Council Morrow? Yes. Council Dagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Uh, Mayor McEachern? Yes. Yeah. Next up, oh, this is. Yep, so, same idea. Uh, requesting that I be authorized into a, to enter into a pilot agreement with the Friends of Lafayette House in the amount of $0. Uh, move that. Uh, I wait a motion that the city manager be authorized to enter into a pilot agreement with the Friends of Lafayette House in the amount of zero dollars. So, so moved. Second. Again. Assistant Mayor okay. Kelly? Yes. Council Tabor? Yes. Council Denton? Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Zero. Thank you. Uh, Presentations and written communications. We have the financial update as requested by Councillor Tabor, uh, already done. Uh, I wait a motion now for email correspondence to be accepted and placed on file. So moved. Second. Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. Councillor Tabor. Yes. Councillor Denton. Yes. Councillor Moreau. Yes. Councillor Big Bagley. Yes. Councillor Lombardi. Yes. Councillor Blaylock. Yes. Councillor Cook. Yes. Mayor McEachern. Yes. Zero. Uh, now we're on to the council agenda. Uh, it's a, uh, I, with uh, regret, I uh, received the resignation of Allison Hamilton and Judith Bunnell from the Citizen Advisory Committee. Uh, we thank you uh, for your service. Um, next up, appointments to be considered, Annalise Hartley to the Citizen Advisory Committee, uh, Kirsten Barton, to the Citizen Advisory Committee, and uh, Shashiko uh, Akiyama uh, to the Cultural Planning Subcommittee. They will be voted on next week. Um, and then the reappointment to be voted this week is Kelly Delecta to the Board of Library Trustees. That would be a roll call vote. Uh, I'd wait a motion to appoint Kelly Delecta to the Library Board of Trustees. So moved. Second. <clears throat> Uh, Sister Mayor Kelly? Yes. Council Tabor? Yes. Council Denton? Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Yeah. And next up we have Councilor Blaylock. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, so I know the, uh, the paper that's online, there's been a um, you know, some buildings been um, getting dem demolitioned in town. Um, there's been some concern by the citizens. I simply just want to ask the question from legal and planning department um, on the current demolition ordinance um, and if there's any alternatives considered. Um, as I understand it right now, the historic district um, is the only place where we can prevent an actual demolition. I don't know if the demolition ordinance has any actual um, teeth to it. But that's why I would um, cut these questions from the public, and I'd, I'd uh, want to pass. So I'd ask um, report back from legal and planning on the current demolition ordinance and the alternatives to consider. We're happy to do that, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. Uh, no. Is there a sec? Is that a in the uh, Did you do a motion? Uh, yeah, I'll make a motion to have a report back from legal. Um, and planning on the current demolition ordinance and any alternatives to consider. Second. Um, and like I said before, just so um, the public can understand um, how much control the demolition ordinance has and what, yeah, um, any alternatives to consider. Thank you. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Council Tabor? Yes. Council Denton? Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. 
Council Blaylock. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. Mayor McEachern. Yes. There. Next up, Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, as you can all see in your packet, I have three items um, that are all coming forward from the Governance Committee because we're wrapping up our work for the year. Um, the first of those is the draft changes to the sidewalk policy. So I would move to schedule discussion of the draft changes from the Governance Committee to the City Council sidewalk policy at the November 13th, 2023 City Council meeting. Second. Um, thank you. Um, the changes that are coming forward on sidewalks um, were requested by the Council uh, over a year ago, um, and we finally have had a full review. I want to thank the Deputy City Manager Woodland and DPW Director Peter Rice for working very hard to determine where we have brick sidewalks in the city, which helped the Governance Committee determine what policy to bring back to the Council. So um, I just ask that you all support us in considering that at our next Council meeting. All right. Um, Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Council Tabor? Yes. Council Denton? Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Yes. The second item is an ethics and transparency policy. Um, I'd like to move to schedule discussion of a draft ethics and transparency policy from the Governance Committee at the November 13th, 2023 City Council meeting. Can I get a second? I'll speak second. second. Thanks. Um, the ethics policy um, came, came about because the Governance Committee was concerned that there isn't a lot of guidance in our ethics ordinance um, on uh, how to uh, engage in, in ethical behavior at the council level um, so that you avoid having any offenses that go or are filed as an ethics complaint. And so we're providing general guidance through a policy for the council. Um, and we would hope that everyone here reviews that and that we have an opportunity to discuss that at the council in November. Okay. You're on. Um, and I would add that this is a policy as opposed to an ordinance. So this is policy that would be adopted for the council. Future councils could change it. Um, and, but I think it would put healthy uh, guidelines in place that we as a council could could lead. Any other discussion? Okay. Sister Mayor Kelly? Yes. Council Tabor? Yes. Council Denton? Yes. Council Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. And zero. And finally, uh, municipal officials' disclosures. Um, I'd like to move to schedule first reading of the ordinance amendments proposed by the Governance Committee to the Municipal Official Disclosure Ordinance, Chapter 1, Article 9, Section 1.901, at the November 13, 2023, City Council meeting. Second. Um, these are the last of the ordinance changes that complete the full package of ethics changes coming forward from the Governance Committee. Um, this change really adds a request to list affiliations with organizations in which a person serving has a fiduciary <laughs> capacity. So um, that is a, a practice that we already engage in. It's just not really clear in the ordinance that we already engage in it, so that it adds that requirement to um, this ordinance. Um, so I would request that we schedule first reading um, at the next meeting. Um, and I would also note that we have a tight timeline clearly for adoption of ordinance changes. Hey, Councilor Moreau. I just have some questions, um, just because I want to make sure at least I'm, if I'm not clear, then nobody else can be clear. Um, I have a lot of probably fiduciary duties on many different levels, even beyond the city. Um, so I do we have to disclose, for instance, everyone knows I'm an RPC commissioner. I'm also the vice chair of the RPC, right? And will be named chair next July, if that's what they so wish. Um, I'm also president of my condo association. So I get that sort of more private, nobody would know about, so I disclose that. But do I have to disclose my actual position held in a commission I have through the city? Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think that the request is that you disclose the position held and if you're serving on any board of any or any type of organization where you have an actual fiduciary responsibility and if that organization is in the city or does business in the city. So um, I think that that's the critical level. If, if you're on, for example, a board of an organization that has no affiliation with the city of Portsmouth and none of, it work, none of its work is done here, then that is not um, relevant. What is relevant is that anything, any board work you do, any condo association, anything that is directly impacting or could impact the city of Portsmouth or which you might have a conflict in relation to having that fiduciary capacity and having your fiduciary capacity here sitting on the council. So I think that helps explain it to everyone. Thank you. Any other questions? Roll call vote, please. Sister Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Morrow? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Zero. And we've already approved the fire truck. Um, next up, oh, was this the, we've already done this through the um, mm -hmm. yeah. nonprofit filing. All right, anything on miscellaneous? Well, for those that are still watching at home, there are two candidate forums tomorrow, um, Tuesday and Wednesday at 8 a.m. at Strawberry Bank. Wish all the candidates uh, running uh, well uh, in the election, and we'll be back after the election. Good night, Portsmouth. Bye. Oh, motion to adjourn. We got it. Can we just, if Vince gets off, we can just do this all. Uh, <laughs> motion to adjourn. So so, so we'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night, Portsmouth. <laughs>